Hello and welcome to this fun time performance of The Winter's Tale. Uh, I am Sarah and I have dragged all of these people in with me to do a what should be an extremely fun version of Win The Winter's Tale. We're all playing several roles and it's going to be a great time. So thank you very much for joining us. So, we start off with Act 1, Scene 1, in an antechamber in Leontes' palace. Enter Camillo and Archidamus. If you shall chance, Camillo, to visit Bohemia on the like occasion where all my services are now on foot, you shall see, as I have said, great difference between our Bohemia and your Cecilia. I think this coming summer, the king of Sicilia means to pay Bohemia the visitation which he justly owes him. Wherein our entertainment shall shame us, we will be justified in our loves, for indeed. This is sure. Verily, I speak it in the freedom of my knowledge. We cannot with such magnificence, in so rare, I know not what to say. Uh, we will give you sleepy drinks that your senses, unintelligence to our insufficience, may, though they cannot praise us, as little accuse us. You pay a great deal too dear for what's given freely. Believe me, I speak as my understanding instructs me, and as mine honesty puts it to utterance. Cecilia cannot show himself over kind to Bohemia. They were trained together in their childhoods, and they are rooted betwixt them than such an affection which cannot choose but branch now, since their more mature dignities and royal necessities made separation of their society, their encounters, though not personal, have been royally atoned with interchange of gifts, letters, love and embassies, that they have seemed to be together, though absent, shook hands as over a vast and braced, as it were, from the ends of opposed winds. The heavens continue their loves. I think there is not in the world either malice or matter to alter it. You have unspeakable comfort of your Prince Mamilius. It is a gentleman of the great promise that ever came into my note. I very well agree with you in the hopes of him. It is a gallant child, one that indeed physics the subject, makes old hearts fresh. They that went on crutches ere he was born desire yet their life to see him a man. Would they else be content to die? Yes, if there were no other excuse why they should desire to live. If the king had no son, they would desire to live on crutches till he had one. And they both exit. Act 1, Scene 2. A room of state in the same. Enter Leontes, Hermione, Mamilius, Polyxenes, Camillo, and attendants. Nine changes of the watery star have been the shepherd's note since we have left our throne without a burden. Time as long again would be fined up, my brother, with our thanks. And yet we should, for per perpetuity, go hence in debt, and therefore, like a cipher, yet standing in a rich place, I multiply with one, we thank you, many thousands more that go before it. Stay your thanks a while and pay them when you part. Sir, that's tomorrow. I am questioned by my fears of what may chance or breed upon our absence. That may blow no sleeping winds at home to make us say, this is put forth too truly. Besides, I have stayed to tire your royalty. We are tougher, brother, than you can put us to it. No longer stay. One seven night longer. Very sooth, tomorrow. We'll part the time betweens them, and in that I'll no gainsaying. Press me not, beseech you so. There is no tongue that moves, none, none I would, neither world, so soon as yours could win me. So it should now, were there necessity in your request, although to a needful I denied it. My affairs do even drag me homeward, which to hinder were in your love a whip to me. My stay to you a charge and trouble, to save both, farewell, our brother. Tongue-tied, our queen, speak you. I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you have drawn oaths from him not to stay. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him you are sure all in Bohemia's well. Dissatisfaction by 
the bygone day proclaimed, say this to him. He is beat from his best ward. Well said, Hermione. To tell, he longs to see his son, or strong. But let him say so then, and let him go. But let him swear so, and he shall not stay. We'll thwack him hence with distaffs. Yet of your royal presence I'll adventure a borrow of a week. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the guest prefixed for his parting. Yet, good deed, Leontes, I love thee not ajar the clock behind what lady she her lord. You'll stay? No, madam. Nay, but you will. I may not, verily. Verily, you put me off with limber vows, but I, though you would seek to unsphere the stars with oaths, should say, Sir, no going, verily, you shall not go, tis a lady's verily, as potent as a lord. Will you go yet? Force me to keep you as a prisoner, not like a guest, so you shall pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks. How say you, my prisoner or my guest? By your dread verily, one of them you shall be. Your guest, then, madam, to be your prisoner should import offending, which is for me less easy to commit than you to punish. Not your jailer, then, but your kind hostess. Come, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. You were pretty lordlings, then. <laughs> we were, fair queen, two lads that thought there were no more behind but such a day to-morrow as to-day, ah, and to be a boy eternal. Was not my lord the verier wag of the two? We were as twinned lambs that did frisk in the sun, and bleat the one at the other. What we changed was innocence for innocence. We knew not the doctrine of ill-doing, nor dreamed that any did. We had pursued that life, and our weak spirits ne'er being higher reared with stronger blood, we should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty. The imposition cleared heredity ours. By this we gather you have tripped since. <laughs> oh, most sacred lady, temptations have since been born to us. For in those unfledged days was my wife a girl. Your precious self had then not crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. Grace to boot, of this make no conclusion, lest you say your queen and I are devils. Yet go on, the offences we have made you do will answer. If you first sinned with us, that, uh, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slipped not with any but us. Is he won yet? He'll stay, my lord. At my request he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spokest to better purpose. Never? Never but once. What? Have I twice said well? When wast before? I prithee, tell me. Crams with praise, and makes a fat as tame things. One good deed, tying tongueless, slaughters a thousand waiting upon that. Our praises are our wages. You may rides with... Uh, one soft kiss a thousand furlongs ere with spur we beat an acre but to the goal my last good deed was to entreat his stay what was my first it has an elder sister or i mistake you oh would her name were grace but one thing before i spoke to the purpose when let me have it i long why, that was when free crab months had sad themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself my love. Then didst thou utter, I'm yours for ever. Tis grace indeed. Why, lo you now, I have spoke to the purpose twice. The one for ever earned a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. Too hot, too hot. To mingle friendship far is mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may free face put on, derive a liberty from heartiness, from bounty, fertile bosom, and well become the agent to may I grant. But to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are, and making practice smiles as in a looking glass, and then to sigh as twere the more to the dear. Oh, 
that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Um, Mamilius, art thou my boy? Hi, my lord. Effect. Why, that's my boarcock. What has smutched thy nose? Uh, they say it is a copy out of mine. Come, Captain, we must be neat. Not neat, but cleanly, Captain. And yet the steer, the heifer, and the calf are all called neat. Still virginling upon his palm. How now, you wanton carp? Art thou my calf? Yes, if you will, my lord. Thou wants the rush, rough passion, the shoots that I have. Be full like me. Yet they say we are almost as alike as eggs. Women say so, that will say anything, but were they false as or dyed blacks, as winds, as waters, false as dice, are to be wished by one that fixes. No born twixt his and mine. Yet, were it true, to say this boy were like me, Come, Sir Page, look on me with your welkin eye, sweet villain. Most dears, my collop. Can my dam mate be? Affection, thy intention stabs the centre. Thou dost make possible things not so held, communicates with dreams. How can this be? With what's unreal thou coactive art, and fellows nothing, then tis very credent. Thou mayst co-join with something, and thou dost, and that beyond commission. And I find it that to the infection of my brains and the hardening of my brows. What means Cecilia? He seems, he something seems unsettled. How, my lord, what cheer? How's with you, best brother? You look as if you held a brow of much distraction. Are you moved, my lord? No, in good earnest. How sometimes nature will betray its folly, its tenderness, and make itself a pastime to harder bosoms. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, me thoughts I did recall twenty-three years, and I saw myself unbreached in my green velvet coat, my dagger muzzled lest it should bite its master, so prove as ornaments oft do too dangerous. dangerous. How like me thought, I was then to this colonel, this squash, this gentleman. Mine honest friend, will you take eggs for money? No, my lord, I will fight. <laughs> you will. Why, happy man be stole. My brother, are you so fond of your young prince as we do seem to be of ours? If at home, sir, he's all my exercise, my mirth, my matter, now my sworn friend, and then mine enemy, my parasite, my soldier, statesman, all. He makes a July's day short as December, and with his varying childness cures in me thoughts that would thick my blood. So stands this squire, officed with me. We two will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. Hermione, how thou lovest us, show in our brother's welcome. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he is apparent to my heart. If you would seek us, we are yours of the garden. Shall us attend you there? To your own bents dispose you. You'll be found. Be you beneath the sky. I am angling now, though you perceive me not how I give line. Go to, go to. How she holds up the neb, the bill to him, and arms her with the boldness of a wife to her allowing husband. Exit, Polyxenes, Hermione, and attendants. Gone already. Inch thick, knee deep, o'er head and ears a forked one. Go play, boy, go play, thy mother plays, and I play too. But so disgrace the part whose issue will hiss me to my grave, contempt and clamour will be my knell. Go play, boy, play. There have been, 
or I'm much deceived, cuckolds ere now. And many a man there is, even at this present, now while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, that little thinks she has been sluiced in its absence, and his pond fished by the next neighbour, by Sir Smile, his neighbour. Nay, there's comfort in it, whilst other men have gates, and those gates open with mine against their will. Should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. Physic for it, there is none. It is a bawdy planet that will strike where tis predominant. Tis powerful. Think it from east, west, north and south. Be it concluded, no barricado for a belly. Note, it will let in and out the enemy with bag and baggage. Many thousands ons have the disease, and feel it not. How now, boy? I am like you, they say. Why, that's some comfort. What, Camillo there? Aye, my lord. Go play, Mamilius. Thou art an honest man. And Mamilius exits. Camillo, this great sir will yet stay longer. You had much ado to make his anchor hold when you cast out and still came home. Didst note it? He would not stay at your petitions, made his business more material. Didst perceive it? They're here with me already. Whispering, rounding, Cecilia is a so forth. Tis far gone. When I say, shall gust it last. How came to Camillo that he did stay? At the good Queen Santicia. At the Queen's bit. Good should be pertinent. But so it is, it is not. Was this taken by any understanding pate but thine? Thy conceit is soaking, will draw in more than the common blocks. Not noted, is it, but of the finer natures. By some said frills of headpiece extraordinary, lower messes perchance are to this business pure blind. Say. Business, my lord. I think most understand Bohemia stays here longer. Ha! Stays here longer. Aye. But why? To satisfy your highness and the entities of our most gracious mistress. Satisfy! The entreaties of your mistress satisfy! Let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart as well as my chamber councils, wherein, priest-like, thou hast cleansed my bosom. I from thee departed penitent reformed, but we have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that which seems so. Be it forbid, my lord. To bide upon it, thou art not honest, or, if thou inclinest that way, thou art a coward, which hoxes honesty beside, behind restraining from course required. Or else thou must be counted a servant grafted in my serious trust, and therein neg negligent, or else a fool, that sees the game played home, the rich stake drawn, and takest it all for jest. My gracious lord, I may be negligent, foolish, and fearful, in every one of these no man is free, but that this his negligence, his folly, fear, among the infinite doings of the world, sometime put forth in your affairs, my lord, if ever I were willful negligent, it was my folly. If industriously I played the fool, it was my negligence, not weighing well the end. If ever fearful to do a thing where I the issue doubted, where of the execution did cry out against the non-performance, it was a fear which often affects the wisest. This, my lord, are such allowed infirmities that honesty is never free of. But beseech your grace, be plainer with me. Let me know my trespass by its own visage. If I then deny it, it is none of mine. 
Have you not seen Camillo? But that's past doubt. You have, or your glass eye is thicker than a cuckold's horn. Or heard? For to a vision so apparent rumour cannot be mute. Or fault? For cogitation resides not in that man that does not think. My wife is slippery. If thou wilt confess, or else be impudently negative, to have nor eyes, nor ears, nor thought, then say my wife's hobby horse deserves a name as rank as any flax wench that puts to before her prof plight. Say it and justify it. I would not be a standby to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so without my present wenches taken. True, my heart, you never spoke what did become you less than this, which to reiterate was seen as deep as that, though true. Is whispering nothing? Is leaning cheek to cheek? Is meeting noses, kissing with inside lip, stopping the career of laughing with a sigh, a note in fallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swifts, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pin and web, but theirs, theirs only, that would unseen be wicked? Is this nothing? Why then, the world and all that's in it's nothing. The covering sky is nothing. Bohemia is nothing. My wife is nothing, nor nothing have these nothings, if this be nothing. Good, my lord, be cured of this diseased opinion, and betimes what is most dangerous. Say it be, tis true. No, no, my lord. It is, you lie, you lie. I say thou liest, Camillo, and I hate thee. Pronounce thee a gross lout, a mindless slave, or else a hovering temporizer that canst with thine eyes at once see good and evil, inclining to them both. Were my wife's liver infected as her life, she would not live the running of one glass. Who does infect her? Why, he that wears her like a medal hanging about his neck, Bohemia, who, if I had servants true about me, that bear eyes to see alike mine honour as their prophets, their own particular frifts, they would do that which should undo any more doing. Aye, and thou, his cupbearer, whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship, who may see plainly as heaven sees earth, and earth sees heaven how I am gold, might bespice a cup to give to mine enemy a lasting wink, which draught to me were cordial. Sir, my lord, I could do this, and that with no rash portion, but with a lingering drum that should not work maliciously like poison, but I cannot believe this crack to be in my dread mistress, so sovereignly being honourable, I have loved thee. Make that thy question and go rot! Dost think I am so muddy, so unsettled to appoint myself in this fixation? Sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve is sleep, is being spotted, is goads, is fawns, nettles, tails of wasps. Give scandal to the blood of my prince, my son, who I do think is mine and love as mine, without right moving to it. Would I do this? Could a man such blench? I must believe you, sir. I do and will fetch off Bohemia forth, provided that when he is removed, your highness will take again your queen as yours at first, even for your son's sake, and thereby foreseeing the injury of tongues and courts and kingdoms known and allied to yours. Thou dost advise me. Even so, as I mine own course have set down, I'll give her no blemish to her honour. None. My lord, Go then, and with a countenance as clear as friendship wears at feasts, keep with Bohemia and with your queen. 
I'm his cup bearer. If from me he have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. This is all. Do it, and thou hast one half of my heart. Do it not, thou splittest thine own. I'll do it, my lord. I will seem friendly, as thou hast advised me. And Leontes exits. Oh, miserable lady, but for me, what case stand I in? I must be the poisoner of good Polixenus, and my ground to do it is the obedience to a master, one who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. To do this deed, promotion follows. If I could find example of thousands that had struck anointed kings and flourished after, I will not do it. But since no brass, no stone, no parchment bears, not one, let villainy itself forswear, I must forsake the court. To do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. Happy star, reign now. Here comes Bohemia. Re-enter Polizines. This is strange. Methinks my favor here begins to warp, not speak. Good day, Camillo. Hail, most royal sir. What is the news of the court? None rare, my lord. The king hath on him such a countenance as he had lost some province, and a region loved as he loves himself. Even now I met him with customary compliment, when he, wafting his eyes to the contrary, and falling a lip of much contempt, speeds from me, and so leaves me to consider what is breeding that changeth thus his manners. I dare not know, my lord. How? Dare not? Do not. Do you know, and dare not? Be intelligent to me. It is thereabouts, for to yourself, what do you know you must, and cannot say you dare not? Good Camillo, your changed complexions are to me a mirror, which shows me mine changed too. For I must be a party in this alteration, finding myself thus altered with it. There is a sickness which puts some of us in distemper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that yet are well. How? Caught of me? Make me not slighted like the basilisk. I have looked on thousands who have sped the better by my regard, but killed none so. Camillo, as you are certainly a gentleman, there too clerk-like experience, which no less adorns our gentry than our parents' noble names, in whose success we are gentle, I beseech you, if you know aught which does behove behold my knowledge, therefore to be informed, imprisoned not in ignorant concealment. Am I not answer? A sickness caught of me, and yet I well, I must be answered. Dost thou hear, Camillo? I conjure thee by all the parts of man which honour does acknowledge, where, whereof the least is not this suit of mine, that thou declare what indecency thou dost guess of harm is creeping towards me. How far off, how near, which way to be prevented if to be, if not, how best to bear it. Sir, I will tell you, since I am charged in honour and by him that I think honourable, therefore... Mark my counsel, which must be even as swiftly followed as I mean to utter it, or both yourself and me cry lost and so good night. On, good Camillo. I am appointed him to murder you. By whom, Camillo? By the king. For what? He thinks, nay, with all confidence he swears, as he had sinned or been an instrument to vice. You thought uh, that you have touched his queen forbiddenly. Oh, then my best blood turn to an infected jelly, and my name be joked with that this that did betray the best. Turn then my freshest reputation to a savour that may strike the dullest nostril where I arrive, or my approach be shunned, nay, hated too, worse than the greatest infection that e'er was heard or read. So where he's thought over by each particular star in heaven and by all the influences, you may as well forbid the sea for to obey the moon as or by 
of remove of council sheikh the fabric of his folly whose foundation is piled upon his faith and will continue the standing of his body how should this grow i know not but i am sure it is safer to avoid what's grown than question how it is born if therefore you dare trust my honesty that lies enclosed in this trunk which you shall bear alone in pond away tonight your followers, I will whisper to the business, and will by twos and threes at several postings clear them of the city. For myself, I'll put my fortunes to your service, which I hear by this discovery lost. Be not uncertain, for by the honor of my parents I have uttered truth, which, if you seek to prove, I dare not stand by, nor shall you be safer than one condemned by the king's own mouth, thereon his execution sworn. I do believe thee. I saw his heart in his face give me thy hand be pilot to me and thy places shall still neighbor mine my ships are ready and my people did expect my hence departure two days ago this jealousy is for a precious creature as she's rare must it be great and as his person's mighty must it be violent and as he does conceive he is dishonored by a man which ever professed to him why he revenges must in that be made more bitter fear overshades me good expe good expedition be my friend and comfort the gracious queen part of his theme but nothing of his ill-taken suspicion come camillo i will respect thee as a father if thou bearest my life off hence let us avoid it is in mine authority to command the keys of all the postons please your highness to take the urgent hour come sir away and they both exit. And we now move on to Act Two, Scene One, a room in Leontes Palace. Enter Hermione, Her Hermione, Mamilius, and ladies. Take the boy to you. He so troubles me, tis past enduring. Come, my gracious lord, shall I be your playfellow? No, I'll none of you. Why, my sweet lord? You'll kiss me hard and speak to me as if I were a baby still. I love you better. And why so, my lord? Not for because your brows are black, yet black brows, they say, become some women best, so that there be not too much hair there, but in a semicircle or a half moon made with a pen. Who taught you this? I learned it out of women's faces. Pray now, what color are your eyebrows? Blue, my lord. Nay, that's a mock. I have seen a lady's nose that has been blue, but not her eyebrows. <laughs> Hark ye, the queen your mother rounds apace. We shall present our services to find to a fine new prince one of these days, and then you'll wanton with us, if we would have you. She is spread of late into a goodly bulk. Good time encounter her. What wisdom stirs amongst you? Come, sir, now I am for you again. Pray you, sit by us and tell us tale. May your said shall be. As merry as you will. A said tale's best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. Let's have that, good sir. Come on, sit down. Come on. And do your best to frighten me with your spirits. You're powerful at it. There was a man. Nay, come, sit down. Then on. Dwelt by a churchyard. I will tell it softly. Yon cricket shall not hear it. Come on, then, and give it to me in my ear. Enter Leontes with Antagonus, Lords, and others. Was he met there? His train? Camillo with him? Behind the tuft of pines I met them. Never saw our men scour so on their way. I eyed them even to their ships. How blessed am I in my just censure in my true opinion. A lack for lesser knowledge. How accursed in being so blessed. There may be in the cup a spider steeped, and one may drink, depart, and yet partake no venom, for his knowledge is not infected. But if one present the abhorred ingredient to his eyes, make known how he have drunk, he cracks his gorge, his sighs with violent hefts, I have drunk and seen the spider. Camilla was his help in this, his pander. 
There is a plot against my life, my crown, all's true that is mistrusted. That false villain whom I employed was pre-employed by him. He has discovered my design, and I remain a pinched thing. He, a very trick for them to play at will. How came the postern so easily open? By his great authority, which often hath no less prevailed than so on your command. I know it too well. Give me the boy. I'm glad you did not nurse him. Though he does bear some signs of me, yet you have too much blood in him. What is this, sport? Bear the boy hence. He shall not come about her. Away with him! And let her sport herself with that she is big with. For tis Polixenes that had made thee swell thus. But I'd say he had not, and I'll be sworn you would believe my saying, however you lean to the nayward. You, my lords, look on her, mark her well, be but about to say she is a goodly lady, and the justice of your barts, and thereto add, tis pity she's not honest, honourable. Praise her, but for this, her without door form, which on my faith deserves high speech and straight the shrug, the hum, or the ha, these petty brands that cal calumny does use. Oh, I am out, that mercy does, for calumny will sear virtue itself. These shrugs, these hums, these ha's, when you have said she's goodly, come between ere you can say she's honest. But be it known, from him that has most cause to grieve, it should be. She's an adulteress. Should a villain say so, the most replenished villain in the world, were you as much more villain? You, my lord, do but mistake. You have mistook, my lady, Polixenes for Leontes. O oh, thou thing, which I'll not call a creature of thy place, lest barbarism making me the precedent should like a language used to all degrees a mannerly distinguishment leave out betwixt the prince and beggar. I have said she's an adulteress. I have said with whom. More, she's a traitor, and Camillo, Camillo is a federacy with her, and one that knows what she should shame to know herself, but with her most vile principle, that she's a bed-swerver, and even as bad as those that vulgars give bold titles, a and privy to this their last escape. No, by my life, privy to none of this. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge? that you have thus published me. Gentle, my lord, you scarce can write me thoroughly then to say you did mistake. No. If I mistake in those foundations which I build upon, the centre is not big enough to bear a schoolboy's top. Away with her! To prison! He who shall speak for her is afar of guilty, but that he speaks. There's some ill planet reigns. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favourable. Good my lords, I am not prone to weeping, as our sex commonly are, the want of which vain do perchance shall dry your pities. But I have that honourable grief lodged here, which burns worse than tears drown. Beseech you all, my lords, with thoughts so qualified as your charities shall best instruct you, measure me and so the king's will be performed. Shall I be heard? Who is that goes with me? Beseech your highness, my women may be with me, for you see my plight requires it. Do not weep, good fools, there is no cause. When you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in tears as I come out. This action I now go on is for my better grace. Adieu, my lord. I never wished to see you sorry, now I trust I shall. My women, come. You have leave. Go, do our bidding. Hence! Exit Hermione, guarded with ladies. 
Beseech your highness, call the queen again. Be certain what you do, sir, lest your justice prove violence, in the which three great ones suffer, yourself, your queen, your son. For her, my lord, I dare my life lay down and will do it, sir. Please you to accept it, that the queen is spotless, in the eyes of heaven and to you, I mean, in this which you accuse her. If it proves she's otherwise, I'll keep my stables where I lodged my wife. Where I lodged my wife, I'll go in couples with her. Then, when I feel and see no farther trust her, for every inch of woman in the world, I every dram of woman's flesh is false if she be. Hold your pieces, good my lord. It is for you we speak, not for ourselves. You are abused, and by some putter on that will be damned for it. Would I knew the villain? Would I land damn him? Be she honor flawed. I have three daughters. The eldest is eleven, the second and the third nine and some five. If this is proven true, they'll pay for it. By mine honor, I'll geld them. Fourteen they shall not see to bring false generations. They are co-heirs, and I had rather glib myself than they should produce they should not produce fair issue. Cease no more. You smell this business with a scent as cold as a dead man's nose. But I do see it, and feel it, as you feel doing thus, and see with all the instruments that feel. If it be so, we need no grave to bury honesty. There's not a grain of it, to the face to sweeten of the whole dungy earth. What? Lack I credit? I had rather you did lack than I, my lord, upon this ground. More it would content me to have her honour true than your suspicion. Be, flame, be blamed for it how you might. Why? What need we commune with you of this, but rather follow our forceful instigation? Our prerogative calls not your counsels, but our natural goodness imparts this. Which, if you, or stupefied, or seeming so in skill, skill cannot or will not relish a truth like us, inform yourselves we need no more of your advice. This matter, the loss, the gain, the ordering on it, is all properly ours. And I wish, my liege, you had only in your silent judgment tried it without more overture. How could that be? Either thou art most ignorant by age, or thou wert born a fool. Camillo's flight, added to their familiarity, which was as gross as ever touched conjecture that lacks sight only, naught for approbation, but only seeing all other circumstances made up to the deed, does push on this proceeding. Yet, for a greater confirmation, for in an act of this importance to a most piteous to be wild, I have dispatched in post to sacred Delphos, to Apollo's temple, Cleom Cleomenes and Dion, whom you know of stuff's sufficiency. Now from the oracle they will bring all, whose spiritual counsel had shall stop or spur me on. Have I done well? Well done, my lord. Though I am satisfied, and need no more than what I know, Yet shall the oracle give rest to the minds of others, such as he whose ignorant credulity will not come up to the truth. So have we thought it good from our free person she should be confined, lest that the treachery of the two fled hence be left her to perform. Come, follow us. We are to speak in public, for this business will raise us all. To laughter, as I take it, if the good truth were known. And they all exit. Act two, scene two. A prison. Enter Paulina, a gentleman, and attendant. The keeper of the prison, call to him. Let him have knowledge who I am. Good lady. No court in Europe is too good for thee. What dost thou then in prison? Re-enter gentleman with the jailer. Now, good sir, you know me, do you not? For a worthy lady and one whom much I honour. Pray you then. 
conduct me to the queen. I may not, madam. To the contrary, I have expressed commandment. Here's a do to lock up honesty and honour from the axes of gentle visitors. Is lawful, pray you, to see her women, uh, uh, any of them, Amelia? So please you, madam, to put apart these your attendants, I shall bring Amelia forth. I pray now, call her. Withdraw yourselves. Exit, gentlemen and attendants. And, uh, madam, I must be present at your conference. Well, be it so, prithee. Exit, jailer. Here's such a do to make no stain as stain as passes colouring. Re-enter, jailer, with Amelia. Dear gentlewoman, how fares our gracious lady? As well as one so great and so forlorn may hold together, on her frights and griefs which never tender lady hath borne greater, she is something before her time delivered. A, a boy? A daughter, and a goodly babe, lusty and like to live. The queen receives much comfort in says, my poor prisoner, I am as innocent as you. I dare be sworn. These dangerous, unsafe loons of the king beshrew them. He must be told not, and he shall. The office becomes a woman best, I'll take it upon me. If I prove honey mouth, let my tongue blister, and never to my red-looked anger be the trumpet any more. Pray you, Amelia, commend my best obedience to the queen. If she dares trust me with her little babe, I'll show it to the king, and undertake to be her advocate to the loudest. We do not know how he may soften at the sight of the child. The silence often of pure innocence persuades when speaking fails. Most worthy madam, your honour and your goodness is so evident that your free undertaking cannot miss a thriving issue. There is no lady meet for living so meet for this great errand. Please your ladyship to visit the next room. I presently acquaint the queen of your most noble offer, who but today hammered of this design, but durst not tempt the minister of honour, lest she should be denied. Tell her, Amelia. I'll use that tongue I have, if wit flow from tis boldness from my bosom. Let not be doubted, I shall do good. Now be you blessed for it. I'll to the queen, please you, come something nearer. Madam, if it please the Queen to send the babe, I know not what I shall incur to pass it, having no warrant. You need not fear it, sir. This child was prisoner to the womb, and is by law and process of great nature thence freed and enfranchised, not a party to the anger of the King, nor guilty of, if any be, the trespass of the Queen. I do believe it. Do not you fear. Upon mine honour I will stand betwixt you and danger. And they all exit. Act two, scene three. A room in Leontes' palace. Enter Leontes, Antigonus, lords and servants. Nor night, nor day, no rest. It is but weakness to bear the matter thus, mere weakness. If the cause were not in being, part of the cause, he, the adulteress, for the harlot king is quite beyond mine arm, and out of blank and level of mine brain, plot-proof. But she I can hook to me, say that she were gone, given to the fire, a moiety of my rest might come to me again. Who's there? My lord. How does the boy? He took good rest tonight. Just hoped his sickness is discharged. To see his nobleness. Conceiving the dishonour of his mother, he straight declined, drooped, took it deeply, fastened and fixed the shame on it himself. Threw off his spirit, his appetite, his sleep and downright language. Leave me solely. Go, see how he fares. And the servant exits. Aye. Fie, no fault of him. The faults of my revenges that way recoil upon me. In himself too mighty, and in his parties his alliance, 
let him be until a time may serve for present vengeance take it on her camillo and polixenes laugh at me make their pastime at my sorrow they should not laugh if i could reach them nor shall she within my power enter paulina with the child you must not enter nay rather good my lords be second to me i fear you his tyrannous passion more alas than the queen's life a gracious innocent soul more free than he is jealous that's enough madam he hath no slave tonight commanded none should come at him not so hot good sir i come to bring him sleep Tis such as you that creep like shadows by him and do sigh at each his needless heavings, such as you nourish the cause of his awaking. I do come with words as medicinal as true, honest as either, to purge him of that humour that presses him from sleep. What noise there, ho? No noise, my lord, but a needful conference about some gossips for your highness. How? Away with that audacious lady! Antigonus, I charge thee that she should not come about me. I knew she would. I told her so, my lord, on your displeasure's peril and on mine, she should not visit you. What canst not rule her? From all dishonesty he can. In this, unless he take the course that you have done, commit me for committing honour. Trust it, he shall not rule me. Lie you now, you here. When she will take the rein, I let her run, but she'll not stumble. Good, my liege, I come, and I beseech you, hear me, who profess myself your loyal servant, your physician, your most obedient counsellor. Yet that dare less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seem yours. I say, I come from your good queen. Good queen. Good queen, my lord, good queen. I say good queen. And would by combat make her good, so where I am man, the worst bout you force her hence let him that makes but trifles of his eyes first hand me on mine own accord i'll off but first i'll do my errand the good queen for she is good hath brought you forth a daughter here it is commence it to your blessing and paulina lays the child on the ground out a mankind witch Hence with her, out of door, a most intelligencing bald. Not so. I am as ignorant in that as you in so entitling me, and no less honest than you are mad, which is enough, I'll warrant, as this world goes to pass for honest. Traitors! Will you not push her out? Give her the bastard, thou dotard. Thou art a woman tired, unroosted, by thy dame partlet here. Take up the bastard, take it up, I say, give it to thy crone. Forever and venerable be thy hands if thou takest up the princess by that forced baseness which he has put upon. He dreads his wife. So I would you did, then to a past all doubt you'd call your children yours. A nest of traitors. I am none by this good light. Nor I nor any but one that's here and that's himself for he the sacred honour of himself his queens his hopeful sons his babes betrays to slander whose sting is sharper than the swords and will not for as the case now stands it is a curse that he cannot be compelled to it once removed the root of his opinion which is rotten as ever oak or stone was sound a callot of boundless tongue who late have beat her husband and now baits me this brat is none of mine it is the issue of polyxenes hence with it and together with the dam commits them to the fire it is yours and might we lay the old proverb to your charge so like you tis the worse behold my lords although the print be little the whole matter and copy of the father eye nose lip the trick of his frown his forehead nay the valley the pretty dimples of his chin and cheek his smiles the very mouth mould and frame of hand nail finger 
And thou, good goddess nature, which hast made it so like to him that got it, if thou has the ordering of the mind too, amongst all colours nor yellow int, lest she suspect as he does her children, not her husband's. Gross hag. And Rosal, thou art worthy to be hanged that will not stay her tongue. Hang all the husbands that cannot do that feat, you'll leave yourself hardly one subject. Once more, take her hence. A most unworthy and unnatural lord can do no more. I'll have thee burnt. I care not. It is an heretic that makes the fire, not she which burns it. I'll not call you tyrant, but this most cruel usage of your queen, not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy. Something savours of tyranny and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. On your allegiance, out of the chamber with her. Were I a tyrant, where were her life? She does not sort cover me so if she did know me one. Away with her. I pray you, do not push me. I'll be gone. Look to your babe, my lord, tis yours. Jove sent her a better guiding spirit. What needs these hands? You that are thus so tender o'er his follies will never do him good. Not one of you. So, so farewell, we are gone. And Paulina exits. Thou, traitor, hast set on thy wife to this. My child. Away with it. Even thou that hast a heart so tender o'er it, take it hence, and see it instantly consumed with fire. Even thou, and none but thou. Take it up straight. Within this hour bring me word tis done, and by good testimony, testimony or I'll seize thy life with what thou else calls thine. If thou refuse, and wilt encounter with my wrath, say so. The bastard brains with these my proper hands I shall dash out. Go take it to the fire, for thou setst on thy wife. I did not, sir. These lords, my noble fellows, if they please, can clear me in it. We can, we can, my royal, my royal liege. liege. He is not, he is guilty, not guilty of coming of hither. Come hither. Your liars all. Beseech your highness. Give us better credit. We have always truly served you and beseech you. So to esteem of us and on our knees we beg as recompense of our dear services past and to come that you do change this purpose which being so horrible, so bloody must lead on to some foul issue we all kneel i am a feather for each wind that blows shall i live on to see this bastard kneel and call me father better to burn it now than curse it then but be it let it live it shall not neither you sir come you hither you that have so tenderly officious with Lady Marjorie, your midwife there, to save this bastard's life. For tis a bastard, so sure as this beard's grey. What will you adventure to save this brat's life? Anything, my lord, that my ability may undergo and nobleness impose. At least thus much, I'll pawn the little blood which I have left to save the innocent. Anything possible. It shall be possible. Swear by this sword thou wilt perform my bidding. I will, my lord. Mark and perform it. Cease thou. For the fail of any point in it shall not only be death to thyself, but thy lewd-tongued wife, whom for this time we pardon. We enjoin thee, as thou art liege man to us, that thou carry this female bastard hence, and that thou bear it to some remote and desert place, quite out of our dominions, and that there thou leave it, without more mercy, to its own protection and favour of the climate. As by strange fortune it came to us, 
I do injustice charge thee on thy soul's peril and thy body's torture that thou commend it strangely to some place where chance may nurse it or end it. Take it up. I swear to do this, though a present death had more had been more merciful. Come on, poor babe, some powerful spirit instruct the kites and ravens to be thy nurses. Wolves and bears, they say, casting their savageness aside, have done like offices of pity. Sir, be prosperous in this in more than this deed does require, and blessing against this cruelty fight on thy side, poor thing condemned to loss. And Antigonus exits with the child. No, I'll not rear another's issue. Enter a servant. Please, your highness, posts from those you sent of the oracle are come, and our sins. Lerminus and Dion, being well arrived from Delphos, are both landed, hasten to the court. So please you, sir, their speed has been beyond account. Twenty-three days they have been absent. Tis good speed. For tells the great Apollo suddenly will have the truth of this appear. Prepare you, lords. Summon a session that we may arrange your most disloyal lady. For, as she hath been publicly accused, so shall he, she have a just and open trial. While she lives, my heart will be burthened to me. Leave me, and think upon my bidding. And they all exit. We now go on to Act 3, Scene 1. A seaport in Sicilia. Enter Cleomenes and Dion. Climate is delicate, the air most sweet. Fertile the isle, the temple much surpassing the common praise it bears. I shall report, for most it caught me, the celestial habits, methink I should show term them, and the reverence of the grave wearers, <laughs> oh, the sacrifice. How ceremonious, solemn, and unearthly was it in the offering. But of all the burst in the air, deafening voice of the oracle, king to Jove's thunder, so surprised myself that I was missing. If the event of... Sorry. If the event of the journey prove as successful to the queen, hope it so, as it hath been to us rare, pleasant, speedy, the time is worth the use on it. Great Apollo, return all the best. These proclamations so forcing upon Hermione, I little like. The violent carriage of it will clear or end the business when the oracle, thus by Apollo's great divine sealed up, shall the contents discover something rare even then will rush to knowledge. Go, fresh horses, and gracious be the issue. And they both exit. Act three, scene two. A court of justice. Enter Leontes, lords, and officers. This session's to our great grief we pronounce, even pushes against our heart. The party tried, the daughter of a king, our wife, and one of us too much beloved. Let us be cleared of being tyrannous, since we so openly proceed in justice, which shall have due course even to the guilt or the purgation Produce the prisoner. It is his highness's pleasure that the queen appear in prison here in court. Silence! Enter Hermione, guarded. Paulina, Paulina and ladies attending. Read the indictment. <clears throat> Hermione, queen to the worthy... Leontes, king of Sicilia, thou art here accused and arraigned of high treason in committing adultery with Polixenes, king of Bohemia, and conspiring with Camillo to take away the life of our sovereign lord, the king, thy royal husband. The pretense whereof being by circumstances partly laid open, thou, Hermione, 
contrary to the faith and allegiance of a true subject, did counsel and aid them for their better safety to fly away by night. Since what I am to say must be that which contradicts my accusation and the testimony on my part, no other but what comes from myself, it shall scarce boot me to say not guilty. Mine integrity being counted falsehood shall, as I express it, be so received. But thus, if powers divine behold our human actions as they do, I doubt not then but innocence shall make false accusation blush and tyranny tremble at patience. You, my lord, best know who least will seem to do so, my past life hath been as continent, as chaste, as true as I am now unhappy, which is more than history can pattern, though devised and played to take spectators. For behold me, a fellow of the royal bed, which owe a moiety of the throne, a great king's daughter, the mother to a hopeful prince, here standing to prate and talk for life and honor for who pleased to come and hear. For life, I prize it as I weigh grief, which I would spare. For honor, tis a derivate from my, me to mine, and only what I, that I stand for. I appeal to you, I appeal to your own conscience, sir. Before Polixenes came to your court, how I was in your grace. How merited to be so! Since he came, with what encounter so uncurrent I have strained to appear thus, if one jot beyond the bound of honor, or in act or will that way inclining, hardened be the hearts of all that hear me, and my nearest of kin cry fie upon my grave. I ne'er heard yet that any of these bolder vices wanted less impudence to gainsay what they did than to perform it first. That's true enough, though tis a saying, sir, not due to me. You will not own it. More than mistress, of which comes to me in name of fault, I must not at all acknowledge. For Polixenes, with whom I am accused, I do confess I loved him as in honour he required, with such a kind of love as might become a lady like me. With a love even such, and so no other as yourself commanded, which not to have done I think would, I think had been in me both disobedience and ingratitude to you and toward your friend, whose love had spoke ever since it could speak from an infant freely that it was yours. Now for conspiracy, I know not how it tastes, though it be dished for me to try how. All will know, all I know of it is that Camillo was an honest man, and why he left your court, the gods themselves, wanting no more than I, are ignorant. You knew of his departure, as you knew of what you have earned the turn and to do in this absence. Sir, you speak a language that I understand not. My life stands in the level of your dreams, which I'll lay down. Your actions are my dreams. You had a bastard by Polixenes, and I but dreamed it. As you were past all shame, those of your facts are so, so past all truth, which to deny concerns more than avails. For as thy brat hath been cast out, like to itself, no father owning it, which is, indeed, more criminal in thee than it, so thou shalt feel our justice in those whose easiest passage look for no less than death. Sir, spare your threats. The bug which you would fright me with I seek. To me can life be no commodity, the crown and comfort of my life your favour. I do give lost, for I do feel it gone but know not how it went. My second joy and first fruits of my body from his presence I am barred like one infectious. My third comfort, starred most unluckily, is from my breast the innocent milk in its most innocent mouth hailed out to murder. Myself on every post proclaimed a strumpet, with immodest hatred the childbed privilege denied, which longs to women of all fashion. Lastly, hurried here to this place in the open air before I have got strength of limit. 
Now, my liege, tell me what blessings I have here alive that I should fear to die. Therefore proceed. But yet hear this. Mistake me not. No life I prize it not to a straw, but for mine honor, which I would free, if I shall be condemned upon surmises all proofs sleeping else but what your jealousies awake. I tell you, tis rigor and not law. Your honors all, I do refer me to the oracle. Apollo, be my judge. This your request is altogether just. Therefore bring forth, and in Apollo's name, his or oracle. Certain yeah. office of exit. The emperor of Russia was my father. Oh, that he were alive and here beholding his daughter's trial. <laughs> that he did but see the flatness of my misery, yet with eyes of pity not revenge. The officers re-enter with Cleomenes and Dion. You here shall swear upon this sword of justice that you, Cleomenes, and Dion have been both at Delphos, and from thence have brought the sealed-up oracle by the hand delivered of great Apollo's priest, and that since then you have not dared to break the holy seal nor read the secrets in it. All this we swear. Take up the seals and read. <clears throat> uh, Hermione is chaste. Polixenes blameless. Camillo a true subject. Leontes a jealous tyrant, his innocent babe truly begotten, and the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. Now blessed be the great Apollo. Praised. Hast thou read proof? I, my lord, even so as it is here set down. There is no proof at all in the oracle. The second shall, shall proceed. This is mere falsehood. Enter a servant. My lord, the king, the king. What is the business? Oh, so I shall be hated to report it. Reprince, your son with mere conceit and fear of the queen's feet is gone. How? Gone? He's dead. Apollo's angry, and the heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. Mm. Hermione swoons. How now there? This news is mortal to the queen. Look down and see what death is doing. Take her hence. Her heart is but so charged she will recover. I have too much believed in mine own suspicion. Beseech you, tenderly apply to her some remedies for life. Exit Paulina and ladies with Hermione. Apollo, pardon my great profaneness against thine oracle. Oh, reconcile me to Polyxenes. New woo my queen. Recall the good Camillo from whom I proclaim a man of truth, of mercy for being transported by my jealousies to bloody thoughts and revenge. I chose Camillo for the minister to poison my friend, Polixenes, which had been done, but that the good mind of Camillo tardied my swift command, though I with death and with reward did threaten and encourage him. Not doing it and being done, he most humane and filled with honour to my kingly guest and clasp my practice. Quit his fortunes here, which you knew great. And to the hazards of all uncertainties himself commended no richer than his honour. How he glisters through my rust and how his pity does my deeds make blacker. Re-enter Paulina. Woe the while. Oh, cut my lace, lest my heart cracking it break too. What fit is this, good lady? What studied torments, tyrant, hast for me? 
what wheels, racks, fires, what flaying, boiling, and leads or oils, what old or newer torture must I receive, whose every word deserves to taste of thy most worst? Thy tyranny, together working with thy jealousies, fancies too weak for boys, too green and idle for girls of nine. Oh, think what they have done, and then run mad indeed, stark mad, for all thy bygone fooleries were but spices of it. That thou betrayedst Polixenes, twas nothing, that did but show thee of a fool, inconstant and damnable and grateful. Nor was much thou wouldst have poisoned good Camillo's honour, to have him kill a king. Poor trespassers, more monstrous standing by, whereof I reckon the casting forth to crows thy baby daughter, to be for none or little, though a devil would have shed water out of fire or done it. Nor is to directly laid to thee the death of the young prince, whose honourable thoughts, thoughts high for one so tender, cleft the heart that could conceive a gross and foolish sire blemished his gracious dam. This is not, no, laid to thy answer, but the last. O oh, lords, when I have said cry woe, the queen, the queen, the sweetest, dearest creatures, dead, and vengeance fought not drop down yet. The higher powers forbid. I say she's dead, I'll swear it. If word nor oath prevail not, go and see. If you can bring tincture or luster in her lip, her eye heat outwardly or breathe within, I'll serve you as I would do the gods. But, oh, thou tyrant, do not repent these things, for they are heavier than all thy woes can stir. Therefore betake thee to nothing but despair. A thousand knees, ten thousand years together, naked, fasting upon a barren mountain and still winter and storm perpetual, could not move the gods to look that way thou wert. Go on. Go on. Thou canst not speak too much. I have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest. Say no more. However the business goes, you have made fault in the boldness of your speech. I am sorry, Fort. All faults I make, when I shall come to know them, I do repent. Alas, I have showed too much the rashness of a woman. He is touched to the noble heart. What's gone and what's past help should be at past grief. Do not receive affliction at my petition. I beseech you rather let me be punished that have minded you of what you should forget. Now, good my liege, sir, royal sir, forgive a foolish woman. The love I bore your queen, lo, fool again. I'll speak of her no more, nor of your children. I'll not remember you of my own lord, who is lost too. Take your patience to you, and I'll say nothing. Thou well, did speak but well, and most the truth, which I receive much better than to be pitied of thee. Privy, bring me to the dead bodies of my queen and son. One grave shall be for both. Upon them shall the causes of their death appear unto our shame perpetual. One day I'll visit the chapel where they lie, and tears shed there shall be my recreation. So long as nature will bear up this exercise, so long I daily vow to use it. Come and lead me unto these sorrows. And they all exit. Act free, scene free. Bohemia, a desert country near the sea. Enter Antigonus with a child and a mariner. Thou art perfect, then. Our ship hath touched upon the deserts of Bohemia. 
Ay, my lord, and fear we have landed in an ill time. The skies look grimly and threaten present blusters. In my conscience the heavens with that wit we have in hand are angry and frown upon us. Their sacred wills be done. Go, get aboard. Look to thy bark, I'll not be long before I call upon thee. Make your best haste, and not go and go not too far of the land. Tis like to be loud weather, beside this place is famous for the creatures of prey that keep upon it. Go thou away, I'll follow instantly. I am glad at heart to be rid of the business. And C the mariner exits. Come, poor babe. I have heard, but not believed, the spirits of the dead may walk again. If such a thing be, thy mother appeared to me last night, for ne'er was dream so like a waking. To me comes a creature, sometimes her head on one side, sometimes another. I never saw a vessel like of like sorrow so filled and so becoming. In pure white robes, like very sanctity, she did approach my cabin where I lay. Thrice bowed before me, and, gasping to begin some speech, her eyes became two spouts. The fury spent, anon, this did this break from her. Good Antigonus, since fate, against thy better disposition, hath made thy person for the thrower out of my poor babe, according to thine oath, place remote, places remote enough are in Bohemia, there weep and leave it crying, and, for the babe is counted lost for ever, Perdita, I prithee, call it. For this ungentle business, uh, put on thee by my lord, thou shalt ne'er see thy wife Paulina more. And so, with shrieks, she melted into air. Affrighted much, I did in time collect myself, and thought this was so, and no slumber. Dreams are toys, yet for this once, yea, superstitiously, I will be squared by this. I do believe Hermione hath suffered death and that Apollo would, this being indeed the issue of King Poly Polyxenes, it should be, it should here be laid, either for life or death, upon the earth of its right father. Blossom, speed thee well. There lie, and there thy character, there these, which may, if fortune please, both breed thee pretty, and still rest thine. The storm begins, poor wretch. That for thy for poor mother's fault uh, are thus exposed and to loss in what may follow. Weep I cannot, but my heart bleeds, and most accursed am I to be that uh, to buy oaths enjoined to this. Farewell, the day frowns more and more. Thou art like to have a lullaby too rough. I never saw the heavens so dim by day. A savage clamor! May well I get abroad. This is the chase. I am gone forever. Exit pursued by a bear. Enter a shepherd. I would ever know age between 16 and three and 20, or that you would sleep out the rest. For there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing, fighting, hack you now. Would any but those boiled brains of nineteen and twenty to hunt this weather, they have scared away two of my best sheep, which I fear the wolf will sooner find than the master. If anywhere I have them, tis by the seaside, browsing of ivy. Good luck, and we, I... Well, what have we here? Mercy on the barn, a very pretty barn. A boy? Or a child, I wonder. A pretty one, a very pretty one. Sure, a subscape. Though I am not bookish yet, I can read Waiting Gentlewoman in the Scape. This has been some stair work, some trunk work, some behind door work. There were warmer that got this, and the poor thing is here. I'll take it up for pity. Yet I'll tear it till my son come. He hollowed by even now. Whoa! Ho! Ho! Enter clown. Loa, Loa. What are so near? If thou see a thing to talk on when thou art dead and rotten, come hither. What else thou man? I have seen two such sights by sea and by land, but I am not to say it is a sea, for it is now the sky, 
Betwixt the firmament and it, you cannot thrust a bodkin's point. Why, boy, how is it? I would you did but see how it chafes, how it rages, how it takes up the shore. That's not the point. Oh, the most piteous cry of the poor souls, sometimes to see em and not to see em, now the ship boring the moon with her mainmast, and anon swallowed with yest and froth as you'd thrust a cork into a hogshead, and then for the land service to see how the bear tore out his shoulder bone, how he cried to me for help and said his name was Antigonus, a nobleman, but to make an end of the ship, to see how the, the sea flap dragoned it, uh, but first, how the poor souls roared, and, and the sea mocked him, and how, how the poor gentleman roared, and the bear mocked him, both roaring louder than the sea or weather. Name of mercy, when was this boy? Now, now, I have not winked since I saw these sights. The man had not yet cold under the water, nor the bear half dine on the gentleman. He's at it now. Would I have been by to have helped the old man? I would you have been by the ship's side to have helped her? Uh, there your charity would have lacked footing. Heavy matters, heavy matters, but look the here, boy. Now bless us thyself, thou matters with things dying, I would think newborn. He is a sight for thee. Look thee, a bearing cloth for a squire's child. Look thee here, take up, take up, boy, opened. So let's see, it was told me I should be rich by the fairies. This is some changeling. Opened, what's within, boy? You were a made old man, at the sins of your youth are forgiven, you're well to live. Gold, all gold! This is fairy gold, boy, and will prove so. Up with, keep it close, home, home, the next way. We're lucky, boy, and to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. Let my ship go. Come, good boy, the next way home. Go you to the next way your findings. I'll go see if the bear be gone from the gentleman and how much he hath eaten. Uh, they're never cur they never are cursed, but they are hungry. If there be any left of him, I'll bury it. That's a good deed. If thou mayst discern by that which is left of him what he is, fetch me to the sight of him. Mary, I will, and you shall help to put him in the ground. Tis a lucky day, boy, and we'll do good deeds on it. And they both exit. Uh, and that is the end of Act 3. Uh, we're going to take a quick 15-minute uh, break. So see you at around half past two for the next half of The Winter's Tale.
Hello and welcome back to the uh, Crokespear fun time performance of uh, The Winter's Tale. Um, we're all back and we're back with Act 4, Scene 1, Chorus as Time Speaks. So, enter time, the chorus. I, that please some, try all, both joy and terror of good and bad, that makes and unfolds error, now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap. Since it is in my power to overthrow law and in oneself born hour to plant and o'erwhelm custom, let me pass the same I am, ere ancientest order was, or what is now received. I witness to the times that brought them in. So shall I do to the freshest things now reigning, and make stale the glistering of this present, as my tale now seems to it. Your patience is this allowing, I turn my glass, and give my scene such growing as you had slept between. Leontes leaving, the effect of his fond jealousy so grieving that he shuts up himself. Imagine me, gentle spectators, that I now may be in fair Bohemia, and remember well, I mentioned a son of the kings, which Florizel I now name you. And with speed so pace to speak of Perdita, now grown in grace, equal and wondering. What of her ensues, I list not prophecy, but let time's news be known when tis brought forth. A shepherd's daughter, and to what and what to her adheres which follows after, is the argument of time. Of this allow, if ever you have spent time worse ere now, if never, yet that time himself doth say he wishes earnestly you never may. And time exits. Act four, scene two. Bohemia, the palace of Polixenes. Enter Polixenes and Camillo. I pray thee, good Camillo, be no more importunate. Tis a sickness denying thee anything, a death to grant this. It is fifteen years since I saw my country, though I have for the most part been aired abroad, I desire to lay my bones there. Besides, the penitent king, my master, have sent for me, to whose feet and sorrows I might be some away, or I owing to think so, which is another spur to my departure. As thou lovest me, Camillo, wipe not out the rest of thy services by leaving me now. The need I have of thee, thine own goodness hath made. Better not to have had thee than thus to want thee, Thou, having made bis me business, which none without thee can sufficiently manage, must either stay to execute them thyself, or take away with thee the very services thou hast done, which I have not enough considered, as too much I cannot, to be more thankful to thee shall be my study, and my profit therein the heaping friendships of that fatal country, Sicilia, prithee speak no more, whose very naming punishes me with the remembrance of that penitent, as thou callest him, and reconciled king, my brother, whose loss of his most precious queen and children are even now to be afresh lamented. Say to me, when sawest thou the prince Florizel, my son? Kings are no less unhappy, their issue not being gracious, than they are in losing them when they have approved their virtues. Sir, so it is three days since I saw the prince. What his happy affairs may be are to me unknown, but I have recently noted he is of late much retired from court, and is less frequent to his princely exercises than formerly hath, hath appeared. I have considered so much, Camillo, and with some care, so far that I have eyes under my service which look upon his removedness, from whom I have this intelligence that he is seldom from the house of a most homely shepherd, a man, they say, that from very nothing and beyond the imagination of his neighbours is grown into an unspeakable estate. I have heard, sir, of such a man who hath a daughter of most rare note. The report of her is extended more that can be thought to begin from such a cottage. 
that's likewise part of my intelligence. But, I fear, the angle that plucks our son thither, thou shalt accompany us to the place where we will, not appearing what we are, have some question with the shepherd, from whose simplicity I think it not an easy to get the cause of my son's resort thither. Prithee, be my present partner in this business, and lay aside thy thoughts of Sicilia. I willingly obey your command. <laughs> my best, Camillo. We must disguise ourselves. They both exit. Act 4, scene 3. A road near the shepherd's cottage. Enter Autolycus. When daffodils begin to peer with high the doxy over the dill, why then comes in the sweet of the year for the red blown rains in the winter's pale, the white sheet bleaching on the hedge with high the sweet Birds, oh, how they sing, doth set my pugging tooth on edge, for a quart of ale is a dish for a king, the lark, the teary lark chants, with high, with high, the thrush and the jay, a summer songs from me and my aunts, while we lie tumbling in the hay. <laughs> I have served the Prince Florizel, and in my time wore three pile, but now I am out of service. Uh, but shall I go mourn for that, my dear? The pale moon shines by night, and when I wander here and there, I then do most go right. If tinkers may have leave to live, and bear the sow-skin budget, then my account I weigh, I weigh, well may give, and in the stocks avouch it. My traffic is sheets, when the kite builds look to lesser linen. My father named me Autolycus, who, being, as I am, littered under mercury, was likewise a snapper-upper of unconsidered trifles. With dye and drab, I purchased this comparison, and my revenue is the silly cheat. Gallows and knock are all too powerful on the highway. Beating and hanging are terrors to me. For the life to come, I sleep out the thought of it. A prize, a prize. Enter Clown. Let me see. Every leaven weather tods, every tod yields pound and odd shilling. Fifteen hundred short. What comes the wool to? Yeah, if this spinch hold, a cock's mine. I cannot do it without counters. Let me see. What am I to buy for our sheep shearing feet? Three pound of sugar, five pound of currants, rice. What will this sister of mine do with rice? But my father hath made her mistress of the feast, and she lays it on. She hath made me four and twenty nosegays for the shearers, three man song men all, and very good ones, but they are most of them means and bases. Hmm. But one Puritan among them, and he sings psalms to hornpipes. I must have saffron to color the warden pies, mace, date, no, that's out of my note, nutmegs, seven, a race or two of ginger, uh, but that I may beg four pounds of prunes and as many of raisins of the sun. Oh, that ever I was born. In the name of me. Oh, help me, Ob's help me. Autoclitus grovels on the ground. Oh, help me, help me. Pluck but off these rags, and then death, death. Alack, poor soul, thou hast needs more of more rags to lay on thee rather than to have these off. Oh, sir, the loathsomeness of them offends me more than the stripes I have received, which are mighty ones and millions. Alas, poor man, a million of beaten may come to a great matter. I am robbed, sir, and beaten, my money and apparel taken from me, and these detestable things put upon me. What, by a horseman or a footman? A, a footman, uh, sweet sir, a footman. Indeed, he should have been a footman by the garments he has left of th with thee. Uh, if this be a horseman's coat, it hath seen very hot service. Let me that hand, I'll help thee. Come, let me that hand. Oh, good sir, tenderly, oh. Alas, poor soul. Oh, good sir, softly, good sir. I fear, sir, my shoulder blade is out. How now, can't stand? Auto-like, auto-like us picks the clown's pocket. 
Softly, dear sir. Good, sir. Softly. You have done me a charitable office. Dost lack any money? I have a little money for thee. Oh, no. Good, sweet sir. No. I beseech you, sir. I have a kinsman not past uh, three quarters of a mile hence unto whom I was going. I shall there uh, have money or anything I want. Uh, offer me no money, I, I pray you. That kills my heart. What manner of fellow was he that robbed you? Oh, a, a fellow, sir, that I have known to go about with troll my dames. I knew him once, a servant of the prince. I cannot tell, good sir, for which of his virtues it was, but he was certainly whipped out of the court. His vices, you would say. There's no virtue whipped out of the court. They cherish it to make it stay there, and yet it will no more but abide. Vices, I would say, sir. I know the man well. He hath been since an ape-bearer, then a process-server, a bailiff, then he compassed a motion of the prodigal son, and married a tinker's wife within a mile where my land and living lies, and having flown over many knavish professions, he settled only in rogue. Some call him Autolycus. Out upon it. Prig, for my life, prig, he haunts wakes, fairs, and bear baiting. Very true, sir. Sir, he, sir, that's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Not a more cowardly rogue in all Bohemia. If you had but looked big and spit at him, he'd have run. I must confess to you, sir, I am no fighter. I am false of heart that way, and that he knew, I warrant him. How do you know? How do you now? Uh, sweet sir, much better than I was. I, I can stand and walk. I will even take my leave of you, a, a pace softly towards my kinsman. Shall I bring thee on the way? Oh, no, good face, sir, no, sweet sir. Then fairly well, I must go buy spices for our sheep shearing. Prosper you, sir, sweet sir. Clown exit. Your purse is not hot enough to purchase your spice. I'll be with you at your sheep shearing too. If I make not this cheat bring out another, and the shearers prove sheep, let me be unrolled and my lame put in the book of virtue. Jog on, jog on, the foot pathway, and merrily hence the style. A merrily heart goes all the day, your sad tires in a mile. And he exits. Act four, scene four. The Shepherd's Cottage. Enter Florizel and Perdita. These your unusual weeds to each part of you do give a life. No shepherdess but Flora peering in April's front. This your sheep shearing is a meeting of the pretty gods, and you the queen aunt. Sir, my gracious lord, chide at your extremes it not becomes me. Oh, pardon that I name them. Your high self, the gracious mark of the land you have obscured, the swain's wearing, and me, poor low maid, most goddess-like pranked up, but that our feasts in every mess have folly, and the feeders digested with a custom. I should blush to see you so attired, sworn, I think, to show myself a blouse. I bless the time when my good falcon made her flight across thy father's ground. Now Jove afford you cause. To me the difference forges dread. Your greatness hath not been used to fear. Even now I tremble to think your father, by some accident, should pass this way as you did. Oh, fates! How would he look to see his work so noble, vilely bound up? What would he say? Or how should I, in these my borrowed flocks, behold the sternness of his presence? Apprehend nothing but jollity. The gods themselves, humbling their deities to love, have taken the shapes of beasts upon them. Jupiter became a bull and bellowed, the green Neptune a ram and bleated, and the fire-robed god, golden Apollo, a poor humble swain, as I seem now. Their transformations were never for a piece of beauty rarer, nor in a way so chaste, since my desires run not before mine honour, nor my lusts burn hotter than my faith. Oh, but, sir, your resolution cannot hold, when tis opposed as it must be by the power of the king. 
One of these two must be necessities, which then will speak that you must change this purpose, or I my life. <laughs> Thou dearest Perdita, with these forced thoughts, I prithee, darken not the mirth of the feast, or I'll be thine, my fair, or not my father's, for I cannot be mine own, nor anything to any, if I not be thine. To this I am most constant, though destiny say no. Be merry, gentle, strangle such thoughts as these with anything that you behold the while. Your guests are coming. Lift up your countenance as it were the day of celebration of that nuptial which we two have sworn shall come. O oh, Lady Fortune, stand you auspicious. <laughs> See your guests approach. Address yourself to entertain them sprightly, and let's be read with mirth. Enter Shepherd, Clown, Mopser, Dorcas, and others, with Polixenes and Camillo disguised. Fie, daughter, when my old wife lived upon this day, she was both pantler, butler, cook, both dame and servant, welcomed all, served all, would see her son and dance her turn. Now here at upper end of the table, now in the middle on his shoulder and his, her face of fire with labor and the thing she took to quench it, she would to each one sip. You are retired as if you were a feasted one and not the hostess of the meeting. Pray you bid these unknown friends to welcome, for it is a way to make us better friends, more known. Come, quench your blushes and present yourself that which you are, mistress of the feast. Come on and bid us welcome to your ship sharing, as your good flock shall prosper. Sir, welcome. It is my father's will I should take on me the hostess ship of the day. You're welcome, sir. Give me those flowers there, Dorcas. Reverend sirs, for you those rosemary and rue. These keep seeming and savour all the winter long. Grace and remembrance be to you both, and welcome to our shearing. Shepherdess, a fair one are you. Well you fit our ages with flowers of winter. Sir, the year growing ancient, not yet on summer's death, nor on the birth of trembling winter, the fairest flowers of the season are our carnations of streaked gillyboard, which some call nature's bastards. Of that kind are rustic gardens barren, and I care not to get slips of them. Wherefore, gentle maiden, do you neglect them? For I have heard it said there is an art in which their piedness shares with great creating nature. Say there be, yet nature is made better by no mean, but nature makes that mean. So, over that art which you say adds to nature, is an art that nature makes. You see, sweet maid, we marry a gentler scion to the wildest stock, and make conceive a bark of baser kind, but bud of nobler race, this is an art which does not mend nature, change it rather, but the art of nature itself. So it is. Then make your garden rich in gillivores, and do not call them bastards. I'll not put the devil in earth to set one slip of them. No more than were I painted, I would wish this youth should say twere well, and only therefore desire to breed by me. Here's flowers for you. Hot lavender, mint, savoury marjoram, marigold that goes to bed with the sun, with him rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer, and I think they are given to men of middle age. You're very welcome. I should leave grazing where I off your flock, and not leave by gazing. Oh, alas, you'd be so lean. That blast of January would blow you through and through. Now, my fairest friend. I would I had some flowers of the spring that might become your time of day, and yours and yours that wear upon your virgin branches, yet your maiden heads growing. O oh, Proserpina, with the flowers now that frighted thou, let's from Diz's wagon. Daffodils that come before the swallow dares, and take the winds of March with beauty. Violets dim but sweeter than the lids of Juno's eyes, or Cytheria's breath. Pale primroses that die unmarried ere they can behold bite Phoebus in his strength, a malady most incident to maids, bold oxlips in the crown imperial, lilies of all kinds, the flower de luce being one. Oh, these I lack to make you garlands of, and my sweet friend, to strew him o'er and o'er. 
What? Like a course? No, like a bank for love to lie and play on. Not like a course, or if not to be buried, but quick and in my nod. Come, take your flowers. He thinks I play as I have seen him do in wits and pastorals. Sure, this robe of mine does change my disposition. What you do still betters what is done. When you speak, sweet, I'll have you do it ever. When you sing, I'll have you buy and sell so. So give alms, pray so, and for the ordering your affairs, to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish away for the sea, that you might ever do nothing but that. Move still, still so, and own nothing, no other function. Each your doing, so singular in each particular, crowns what you are doing in the present deed, that all your acts are queens. Oh, Daracles, your praises are too large, but that your youth and a true blood which peepeth fairly throughout do plainly give you out an unstained shepherd. With wisdom I might fear, my Daracles, you'd wooed me in a false way. I think you have as little skill to fear as I have purpose to put you to it. But come, our dance, I pray, your hand, my Perdita, so turtles pair that never mean to part. I'll swear for him. This is the prettiest low-born lass that ever ran on the green sward. Nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself, too noble for this place. He tells her something that makes her blood look out. Good sooth, she is the queen of curse and dream. Come on, strike up. Mopsa must be your mistress. Mary, garlic to mend her kissing with. Now, in good time. Not a word, not a word. We stand upon our manners. Come, strike up. And there is music. Here is a dance of shepherds and shepherdesses. Pray, good shepherd, what fair swain is this which dances with your daughter? They call him Doricles and boast himself to have a glory feeding, but I have it upon his own report, and I believe it. He looks like so. He says he loves my daughter. I think so too, for never gaze the moon upon the water as he'll stand and read as to my daughter's eyes. And to be plain, I think there is not half a kiss to choose who loves another best. She dances featly. So she does anything, though I reported that should be silent. If young Doricles do light upon her, she shall bring him that which he not dreams of. Enter servant. Oh, master, if you did but hear the peddler at the door, you would never ga dance again after a tabor and pipe. No, the bagpipe could not move you. He sings several tunes faster than you'll tell mummy. He utters them as, the, as he had eaten ballads, and all men's ears grew to this tunes. He could not come better, he shall come in. I love a ballad, but even too well. If it be doleful matter, merrily sit it down, or a very pleasant thing indeed, and sung lamentably. He hath songs for man or woman. Of all sizes, no milliner can so fit his customers with gloves. He has the prettiest love songs for the maids, so without bawdry, which is strange, with such delicate bourbons of dildos and bathings, jumper and bumper, and when some stretch-mouthed rascal would, as it were, mean mischief and break a foul gap into the matter, he makes the maid answer, whoop, do me no harm, good man. He puts him off, slights him, with whoop, do me no harm, good man. This is a brave fellow. Believe me, thou talkest of an admirable conceited fellow. Has he any unbraided wear? He hath ribbons of Anne the Colour, of Anne the Colour and the Rainbow, points more than all the lawyers in Bohemias can learnedly handle, though they come to him by the gross, inkles, caddises, cambrics, lawns, why, he sings them over as they were gods and goddesses. You would think a smock were a she-angel, he so chants to the sleeve hand and the work about the square on it. Prithee, bring him in, and let him approach singing. Forewarn him that he used no scurrilous word in his tune. Exit servant. You have 
of these peddlers that have more in them than you'd think, sister. I, good brother. Or go about to think. Enter Autolycus. <laughs> Lawn as white as driven snow, Cypress black as air was crow, Gloves as sweet as damask roses, Masks for faces and for noses, Bugle bracelet, necklace amber, Perfume for a lady's chamber, Golden coughs and stomachers, For my lads to give their dears, Pins and poking sticks of steel, what made like from head to heel. Come by of me, come, come, come by, by lads, or else your lessons cry. Come by. If I were not in love with Mopsa, thou shouldst take no money of me. But being enthralled as I am, it will be the will also be the bondage of certain ribbons and gloves. I was promised them against the feast, uh, but they come not too late now. He hath promised you more than that, or there be liars. He hath paid you all he promised you. Uh, maybe he has paid you more, which will shame you to give him again. Is there no manner left among maids? Will they wear their plackets where, their sho where they shoulder bare their faces? Is there not milking time when you are going to bed or kiln home to whistle off these secrets, but you must be tittle tattling before all our guests? Tis well they are whispering. Clamor your tongues and not a word more. I have done. Come, you promised me a tawdry lace and a pair of sweet gloves. Have I not told thee how I was cousined by the way and lost all my money? Uh, and indeed, sir, that our cousin is abroad, therefore it behoves men to be wary. Fear thou, man, thou shalt lose nothing here. I hope so, sir, for I have about me many parcels of charge. Uh, what hast here, ballads? Uh, pray now, buy some. I love a ballad in print alive, for then we are sure they are true. Here's one to a very doleful tune, how a usurer's wife was brought to bed of twenty money bags at a burden, and now she longed to eat adder's heads and toads carbono dude. Is it true, think you? Very true, but a month old. <laughs> Bless me for marrying a usurer. Here's the midwife's name to it, one mistress tail porter, and five or six honest wives that were present. Why should I carry lies abroad? Uh, pray do now, uh, buy it. Come on, lay it by, and let's first see more ballads. Uh, we'll buy the other things on. Uh, here's another ballad of a fish that appeared upon the coast on Wednesday, the fourscore of April, 40,000 fathom above water, and sung this ballad against the hard hearts of maids. It was thought she was a woman and was turned into a cold fish, for she would not exchange flesh with one that loved her. The ballad is very pitiful and as true. Is it true too, thank you? Five justices' hands at it, and witnesses more than my pack will hold. Lay it by two, another. This is a merry ballad, but a very pretty one. Let's have some merry ones. Why, this is a passing merry one and goes to the tune of uh, two maids wooing a man. Uh, there's scarce a maid westward, but she sings it. Uh, Tis in request, I can tell you. We can both sing it. If thou pair apart, thou shalt hear. Uh, Tis in three parts. We had the tune on it a month ago. I can bear my part. You must know it is my occupation. Uh, have at it with you. There's apparently a song here. But we don't have the lyrics for it in the script. So I guess you're going to have to imagine your own song. But have fun in the theatre <laughs> of the mind. And we're back. Get you hence, for I must go where it fits you not to know. Whither? Oh, whither? Whither? It must become thy own full well. Thou to me thy secrets tell. Me too. Let me go thither. Or thou goest to the orange or mill. If to either thou dost ill. Neither. What, neither? Neither. And thou hast sworn my love to be. Thou hast sworn it more to be. Well, wrong voice. Then whither goest? Say whither. 
we'll have this song out by, anon by ourselves. My father and the gentleman are in sad talk and will not trouble them. Uh, come, bring away that pack after me. Wenches, I'll buy for you both. Peddler, let's have the first choice. Follow me, girls. Apparently, that exchange was above was supposed to be a song. So I imagine it was a song. <laughs> it was the music of our hearts. In the music of our hearts, yes. Uh, but anyway, the clown exits with Dorcas and Mopsa. And you shall pay well for him. Will you buy any tape or lace for your cape? My dainty duck, my dear, eh? Any silk, any thread, any toys for your head, or the used and finest, finest wear, eh? Come to the peddler, many's a meddler, that do us the hallman's wear, eh? And he exits. Re-enter servant. Master, there is free carters, free shepherds, free neat, he her neat herds, free swine herds that have made themselves all men of hair. They call themselves saltiers, and they have a dance which the wenches say is a galley mouthry of the gambles, because they are not in it, but they themselves are own the mind. If it not be too rough for some that know little but bowling, it will please plentifully. Away, well, none on't. Here has been too much homely quality already. I, I know, so we weary you. <laughs> you weary those that refresh us, pray. Let's see these four threes of herdsmen. One free of them, by their own report, sir, have danced before the king, and not the worst of the three, but jumps twelve foot and a half by the squire. Leave your prussian senses, good man, a pleased let him come in, but quickly now. Why, they stay at door, sir. Uh, the servant exits, and uh, we get another imaginary dance of twelve satyrs. Oh, father, you'll know more of that hereafter. Is it not too far gone? Tis time to part them. Here's simple and tells much. How now, fair shepherd? Your heart is full of something that does take your mind from feasting. Sooth, when I was young, and hand and love as you do, I was wont to load my she with knacks. I would have ransacked the peddler's silken treasury, and have poured it to her acceptance. You have let him go, and nothing martyred with him. If your lass interpretation should abuse, and call this your lack of love or bounty, you were straighted for a reply. At least, if you make a care of happy holding her. Old sir, I know. She prizes not such trifles as these are. The gifts she looks from me are packed and locked, up in my heart, which I have given already, but not delivered. Oh, here make me breathe my life before this ancient sir, who, it should seem, hath some time loved. I take thy hand, this hand, as soft as dove's down and as white as it, or Ethiopian's tooth, or the fanned snow that's bolted by the northern blast twice o'er. What follows this? How prettily the young swain seems to wash the hand was fair before. I have put you out. But to your protestation, let me hear what you profess. Do and be witness to it. And this my neighbour too? And he, and more than he, and men, the earth, the heavens, and all, that I crowned the most imperial monarch, thereof most worthy, were I the fairest youth that ever made I swerve, had force and knowledge more than was ever man's, I would not prize them without her love, for her employ them all, command them, and condemn them to her service or to their own perdition. Fairly offered. We chose to sound affection. But my daughter say you the like to him? I cannot speak so well, nothing so well, no, nor mean better than the, by the pattern of mine own thoughts I cut out the purity of his. Take hands, a bargain, and friends unknown, you shall bear witness to it. I give my daughter to him and will make your portion equal his. 
Oh, that must be I, the virtue of your daughter. One being dead, I shall have more than you can dream of yet. Enough then for your wonder. But come on, contract us for these witnesses. Come, your hand, and daughter yours. A soft swain a while, beseech you, have you a father? I have, but what of him? Knows he of this? He neither does nor shall. Methinks a father is at the nuptial of his son a guest that best becomes the table. Pray you once more, is not your father grown incapable of reasonable affairs? Is he not stupid with age and altering rooms? Can he speak here, no man from man, dispute his own estate? Lies he not bedrid, and again does nothing but what he did being childish? No, good sir, he hath his health and ampler strength indeed than most have, have of his age. By my white beard, you offer him, if this be so, a wrong something unfilial. Reason, my son, should choose himself a wife, but as good reason the father, whose all, all whose joy is nothing else but fair posterity, should hold some counsel in such a business. I yield all this, but for some other reasons, my grave sir, which tis not fit you know, I not acquaint my father of this business. Let him know it. He shall not. Prithee, let him. No, he must not. Let him, my son. He shall not need to grieve at knowing of thy choice. Oh, come, come, he must not. Mark our contract. Mark your divorce, young sir. And Polixenes takes off his disguise. Whom, son, I dare not call. Thou art too base to be acknowledged. Thou, a scepter's heir, that thus affectest a sheep-hook. Thou old traitor, I am sorry that by hanging thee I can but shorten thy life one week. And thou, fresh piece of excellent wishcraft, who of force must know the royal fool thou copest with. Oh, my heart. I'll have thy beauty scratched with briars, and made more homely than thy state. For thee, fond boy, if I may ever know thou dost but sigh, that thou no more shalt seek this knack, as never I mean thou shalt, will bar thee from succession, not hold thee of our blood, no, not our kin, for off then Duke Salian off, mark thou my words, followers to the court. Thou chill, for this time, though full of our displeasure, yet we free thee from the dead blow of it, and you, enchantment, worthy enough a herdsman, yea, him too, that make himself, but for our honour therein, unworthy thee, if ever henceforth thou these rural latches to his entrance open, or hoop his body more within thy braces, I will devise a death as cruel for thee as thou art tender to it. And Polixenes exits. Even here undone, I was not much afeard, for once or twice I was about to speak and tell him plainly, self-same sun that shines upon his court hides not his visage from our cottage, but looks on alike. What please you, sir, be gone. I told you what would come of this, beseech you, of your own state take care. This dream of mine, being now awake, I'll queen it no inch farther, but no my use and weep. Why, how now, father, speak how thou didst? I cannot speak nor think nor dare to know that which I know, or so you have undone a man of force go free, that thought to fill his grave in quiet, yet to die upon the bed my father died, to lie close by his honest bones. But now some hangman must put on my shroud and lay me where no priest shovels in dust. O oh, cursed wretch, that news this was the prince and would adventure to meet good faith with him. Undone, undone, if I might die within this hour, I have lived to die when I desire. And the shepherd exits. Why look you so upon me? I am but sorry, not afeard. Delayed, but nothing altered. What I was, I am. More straining on for plucking back, not following my leash unwillingly. Gracious, my lord, you know your father's temper. At this time he will allow no speech, which I do guess you do not propose to him. And as hardly will he enjoy your sight, as yet I fear, then till the fury of his highness settle, come not before him. 
I not purpose it. I think Camillo. Even he, my lord. How often have I told you twould be thus? How often said my dignity would last but till you're known? It, it cannot fail but by the violation of my faith. And then let nature crush the sides of the earth together and mar the seeds within. Lift up thy looks. From my succession, wipe me, father. I am heir to my affection. Be advised. I am. And by my fancy, if my reason will thereto be obedient, I have reason. If not, my senses, better pleased with madness, do bid it welcome. This is desperate, sir. So call it, but it does fulfil my vow. I needs must think it honesty, Camillo, not for Bohemia, nor the pomp that may be thereat gleaned, for all the sun sees, or the close earth wombs, or the profound sea hides in unknown fathoms, will I break my oath to this my fair beloved. Therefore, I pray you, as you have ever been my father's honoured friends, when he shall miss me, as, in faith, I mean not to see him any more, cast your good counsels upon his passion, let myself and fortune tug for the time to come. This you may know, and so deliver, I am put to sea, with her whom I hear cannot hold on shore, and most opportune to our need, I have a vessel rides fast by, but not prepared for this design. What course I mean to hold shall nothing benefit your knowledge, nor concern me the reporting. Well, my lord, I would your spirit were easier for advice, or stronger for your need. Hark, Padita. And Florizel draws Padita aside. I'll hear you by and by. He is immobile. Resolve to flight. Now I happy if he's going I could frame to serve my turn, save him from danger, do him love and honor, purchase the sight again of dear Sicilia and that unhappy king my master, whom I so much thirst to see. Now, good Camillo, I am so fraught with curious business that I leave out ceremony. Sir, I think you have heard of my poor services in the love that I have done your father. Very nobly. Have you deserved it? It is my father's music to speak your deeds, not little of his care to have them recompensed as thought on. Well, my lord, if you may please to think I love the king and through him what is nearest to him, which is your gracious self, embrace but my direction. If you more ponderous and settled project may suffer alteration on mine honour, I'll point you where you shall have such receiving as shall become your highness where you may enjoy your mistress, from the whom I see there is no disjunction to be made, but by, as heavens forfend, your ruin. Marry her, and with my best endeavours in your absence, your discontented father strive to qualify and bring him up to like him. How, Camillo, may this almost a miracle be done, that I may call thee something more than man, and after that trust to thee. Have you thought on the place where to you'll go? Uh, not any yet, but as the unfurt on accident is guilty to what we wildly do, so we profess ourselves to be the slaves of chance and flies of every wind that blows. Then listen to me. This follows, if you will not change your purpose, but undergo this flight. Make for Sicilia, and there present yourself and your fair princess, for so I see she must be, for Leontis. She shall be habited as it becomes the partner of your bed. Methinks I see Leontis opening his free arms and weeping his welcomes forth, asks the, the son forgiveness as it were in the father's person, kisses the hands of your fresh princess, over and over divides him twixt his unkindness and his kindness, the one he chides to hell and bids the other grow faster than thought of time. Worthy Camillo, what colour for my visitation shall I hold up before him? Sent by the king, your father, to greet him and to give him comfort. Sir, the manner of your bearing towards him with what you, as from your father, shall deliver, things not betwixt us three, I'll write you down, the which shall point you forth at every sitting that you must say, that he shall not perceive but that you have your father's bosom there and speak his very heart. I am bound to you. There is some sap in this. A course more promising than the wild dedication of yourselves to unpuffed waters, untimed shores, more certain to miseries enough. 
no hope to help you, but as you shake off one to take another, nothing to so certain as your anchors who do their best office if they can, but stay you where you'll be love to be. Besides, you know prosperity is the valuable wand of love, whose fresh complexion and whose heart together affliction alters. <laughs> One of these is true. I think affliction may subdue the cheek, but not take in the mind. Yes, yeah, say you so. There shall not at your father's house these seven years be born another such. My good Camillo, she is as forward of her breeding as she is to rear our birth. I cannot say it is pity she lacks instructions, for she seems a mistress to most that teach. <laughs> Your pardon, sir. For this I'll blush you thanks. My prettiest Perdita, but oh, the thorns we stand upon. Camillo, preserver of my father, now of me, the medicine of our house, how shall we do? We are not furnished like Bohemia's son, uh, nor shall appear in Sicilia. My lord, fear none of this. I think you know my fortunes do all lie there. It shall be so my care to have you royally appointed, as if the scene you play were mine. For instance, sir, uh, that you may know you shall not want. One word. The three of them talk aside. Re-enter Autolikers. <laughs> ah, ah, what a fool honesty is. And trust his sworn brother, a very really simple gentleman. I have sold all my trumpery, not a counterfeit stone, not a ribbon, glass, pomander, brooch, table book, ballad, knife, tape, glove, shoot, I bracelet, horn ring to keep my pack from fasting. They throng who should buy first, as if my trinkets had been hallowed and brought a benediction to the buyer, by which means I saw whose purse was best in picture, and what I saw, to my good use, I remembered my clown who wants to be but something to do who wants but something to be a reasonable man grew so in love with the wench's songs that he would not stir his petty toes till he had both tune and words which so drew the rest of the herd to me that all their other senses stuck in ears you might have pinched a blank a placket it was senseless it was nothing to gild a codpiece of a purse i could have filled keys of that hung in chains no hearing, no feeling, but my sir's song, and admiring the nothing of it, so that in this time of the Ravaji I picked and cut most of their festival purses, and had not the old man come in with a woo-bub against his daughter and the king's son, and scared my coughs from their chaff, I had not left a purse alive in the whole army. Camillo, Florizel, and Perdita come forward. Nay, but my letters by this means being there so soon as you arrive shall clear the doubt. And those that you'll procure from King Leontes shall satisfy your father. Happy be you, all that you speak shall fair. Who have we here? He looks at Auto Lycus. We'll make an instrument of this, Amid nothing may give us aid. If they have heard me now, why hanging? How now, good fellow? Why shakes thou so? Fear not, man. He is no harm intended to thee. Uh, I am a poor fellow, sir. Why be so still? He is nobody will steal that from thee. Yet for the outside of thy poverty we must make an exchange. Therefore, discase thee instantly, thou must think there is a necessity in it, and change garments with this gentleman. Though the penny was on his side be the worst, yet hold thee this somewhat. I am a poor fellow, sir. I know ye well enough. Nay, privily dispatch. The gentleman is half flayed already. Uh, are you in earnest, sir? I smell the trick on't. Dispatch, I prithee. Indeed, I have earnest, but I cannot with conscience take it. Unbuckle, unbuckle. Florizel and Autolikus exchange garments. Fortunate mistress, let my prophecy come home to you. You must retire yourself into some covert, take your sweetheart's hat and pluck it over your brows, muffle your face, dismantle you, and as you can disliken the troop of your own seeming, that you may, for I do fear, eyes over, to shipboard get indiscreet. I see the place so lies that I must bear a part. No remedy. Have you done there? Should I now meet my father... He would not call me son. Nay, you shall have no head. 
uh, Camillo gives it to Padita. Come, lady, come. Farewell, my friend. Adieu, sir. Oh, Padita, what we have twain forgot. Pray you a word. What I do next shall be to tell the king this escape and whither they are bound, wherein my hope is I shall so prevail to force him after, in whose company I shall review Sicilia, for whose sight I have a woman's longing. Fortune speed us. Thus we set on, Camillo, to the seaside. The swifter sweet speed the better. Um, and Florizel, Perdita, and Camillo exit. I understand the business, and I hear it. To have an open ear, a quick eye, and a nimble hand is necessary for a cut purse. A good nose is requisite also to smell out the work of the other senses. I see this is the time that the unjust man doth thrive. What an exchange had this been without boots. What a boot is here within this exchange. Sure, the gods do this year connive at us, and we may do anything extempore. The prince himself is about peace of iniquity, steaming away from his father with his clog at his heels. If I thought it were a piece of honesty to acquaint the king withal, I would not do it. I hold it the more knavery to conceal it, and therein I am constant to my profession. Oh, sorry. Uh, the clown and the shepherd re-enter. Aside, aside, here is more matter for a hot brain. Every lane's end, every shop, church, session, hanging, yields a careful man work. See? See what a man you are now? There is no way but to tell the king she's a changeling and none of your flesh and blood. Nay, but hear me. Nay, but hear me. Go to, then. She, being none of your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood has not offended the king, and so your flesh and blood is not to be punished by him. Show those things you found about her, those secret things. All but what she has with her, this being done, let the law go whistle, I warrant you. I will tell the king all, every word he and his son springs to, who, I may say, is no honest man, neither to his father nor to me, to go about to make me the king's brother-in-law. Indeed, brother-in-law was the farthest off you could have been to him, and then your blood had been the dearer by I know not know how much an ounce. Very wisely, puppies. Well, let us to the king. There is that, and this father will will make him scratch his beard. I know no I know not what impediment of this complaint may be to the flight of my master. Pray heartily he be at the palace. Though I am not naturally honest, I am so sometimes by chance. Uh, let me pocket up my peddler's excrement. He takes off his false beard. How now, rustics, whither are you bound? So the palace, and then, and then, like your worship. Your affairs there, what, with whom, the condition of that fardel, the place of your dwelling, your names, your ages, of what having, breeding, and any other thing that is fitting to be known, discover. We are but plain fellows, sir. A lie! You are rough and hairy. Let me have no lying. It becomes none but tradesmen, and they often give us soldiers the lie. But we pay them for the, for it with the stamped coin, not stabbing steel. Therefore, do not give us the lie. Your worship had liked to have given us one if you had not taken yourself with the manor. Are you a courtier, and like you, sir? Whether it like me or no, I am a courtier. Seest thou not the air of the court in these enfoldings? Hath not my gait in it the measure of the court? Receive not thy nose, court odour from me? I reflect not on thy baseness, court contempt, thinkest thou, for that I insinuate or toes from thy business. I am therefore no courtier. I am courtier, a cap a pie and one that will either push or pluck back thy business there, whereupon I command thee to open thy affair. My business, sir, is to the king. What advocate hast thou to him? I know not, and like you. 
advocate's the court word for pheasant. Uh, say you have none. None, sir. I have no pheasant, cock nor hen. How blessed are we that are not simple men. Uh, yet nature might have made me as these are, therefore I will not disdain. This cannot be but a great courtier. His garments are rich, but he wears them not handsomely. He seems to be the more noble in being fantastical. A great man, I'll warrant. I know by the picking on's teeth. Uh, the fardel there. What's in the fardel? Uh, wherefore that box? Sir, there lies uh, Shakespeare's in this fardel and box, which none must know but the king, and which he shall know within this hour, if I may come to the speech of him. Age, thou hast lost thy labour. Why, sir? The king is not at the palace. He has gone abroad a new ship to purge melancholy and air himself. For if thou beest capable of serious uh, things, thou must know the king is full of grief. So it is said, sir, about his son that should have married a shepherd's daughter. If that shepherd not be in hand fast, let him fly. The curses he shall have, the tortures he shall feel, oh, will break the back of man, the heart of monster. Thank you so, sir. Not he alone shall suffer what wit can make heavy and vengeance bitter. But those that are germane to him, though removed fifty times, shall all come under the hangman, which though it be a great pity, yet it is necessary. An old sheep-whistling rogue, a ram-tender, to offer to have his daughter come into grace. Some say he shall be stoned, but that death is too soft for him, say I. Draw out our throne into a sheep-coat. All deaths are too few, the sharpest too easy. Has the old man e'er a son, sir, do you hear? And it like you, sir? He has a son, uh, who shall be flayed alive, then anointed over with honey, set on the head of a wasp's nest, then stand till he be three-quartered and a dram dead, then recovered again with aquavity or some other hot infusion, then raw as he is, and in the hottest day prognostication proclaims, shall he be set against a brick wall, the sun looking with a southward eye upon him, where he is to behold him with flies blown to death. But what talk we of these traitorly rascals, whose miseries are to be smiled at, their offences being so capital? Tell me, for you seem to be honest, plain men, what have you to the king, being something gently considered? I'll bring you where he is abroad. Tend your persons to his presence, whisper him on your behalf, and, if it be a man besides the king to effect your suits, here is a man shall do it. Uh, he seems to be of great authority. Uh, close with him, give him gold. And though authority be a stubborn bear, yet he is oft led by the nose with gold. Uh, show the inside of your purse to the outside of his hand, and no more ado. Remember, stoned and flayed alive. And please you, sir, to undertake the business for us. Here's that gold I have. I'll make it as much more and leave this young man in pawn till I bring it to him. After I have done what I promised? Aye, sir. Well, give me the moiety. Are you a party in this business? In some sort, sir, though my case be a pitiful one, I hope I shall not be played out of it. Oh, that's the case of the shepherd's son. Hang him. He'll be made an example. Comfort, good comfort. Uh, we must to the king and show our strange sags. He must note his none of your daughter nor my sister. Uh, we are gone, else. <laughs> sir, I, I will give you as much as this old man does when the business is performed and remain, as he says, your pawn till it be brought you. I will trust you. Uh, walk before towards the seaside. Uh, go on the right hand. I will but look upon the left, on the hedge, and follow you. We are blessed in this man, as I may say, even blessed. That's before, as he bids us, he was provided to do us good. And the shepherd and the clown exit. If I had a mind to be honest, I see fortune would not suffer me. She drops booties in my mouth. I am quartered now with a double occasion, gold, and a means to do the prince my master good, which who knows how that may turn back to my advancement. 
I will bring these two moles, these blind ones, aboard him. If he think it fit to shore them again, and that the complaint they have is to the king concerns him nothing, let him call me rogue for being so far officious, for I am proof against that title, and what shame else belongs to it. To him I will present them. There may be matter in it. And he exits. And that is the end of Act 4, Scene 4. And indeed, Act 4 as a whole. Uh, we're going to take a quick five-minute break because Act 4, Scene 4 was a really long scene and people are tired. But we'll be back at about 3.35. Uh, see you then for the, for the exciting conclusion.
Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to The Winter's Tale. Um, we are now going ahead with Act 5, Scene 1, which is in a room in Leontes' palace. Um, enter Leontes, Cleomenes, Dion, Paulina, and Servant. Sir, you have done enough and have performed a saint-like sorrow. No fault could you make which you have not redeemed. Indeed, pass down the penitence and trespass. At the last, do as the heavens have done. Forget your evil with them. Forgive yourself. Whilst I remember her and her virtues, I cannot forget my blemishes in them. And so still think of the wrong I did myself, which was so much that hairless, airless, hath made my kingdom, and destroyed the sweetest companion that ere man bred his hopes out of. True, too true, my lord. If one by one you wed at all the world, or from the all that are took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. I think so. Killed. She I killed. I did so, but thou strikest me sorely to say I did. It is as bitter upon thy tongue as in my fault. Now, good now, say so but seldom. Ah, not at all, good lady. You might have spoken a thousand that would have done the time more benefit and graced your kindness better. You are one of those would have him wed again. If you would not so, your pity, not the state, nor the remembrance of his most sovereign name, consider little what dangers by his highness's fail of issue may drop upon his kingdom and devour in certain lookers-on. What were more holy than to rejoice the former queen is well? What holier than for royalty's repair to present comfort and for future good to bless the bed of majesty again with a sweet fellow to it? There is none worthy respecting her that's gone. Besides, the cons will have fulfilled their secret purposes, for, has not the divine Apollo said, is not the tenor of his oracle, that King Leontes shall not have an heir till his lost child be found? Which, that it shall, is all as monstrous to our human reason, as my Antigonus to break his grave and come again to me, who on my life did perish with the infant. "'Tis your counsel, my lord, should to the heavens be contrary, oppose against their wills. Care not for issue. The crown will find an heir. Great Alexander left his to the worthiest, so his successor was like to be the best. "'Good Paulina, who has the memory of Hermione, I know in honour. Oh, that ever I have squared me to thy counsel! Then... Even now, I might have looked upon my queen's full eyes, have taken treasure from her lips. And left them more rich for what they yielded. Thou speakest true. No more such wives. Therefore, no wife. One worse and better used would make her sainted spirit again possess her corpse, and on this stage where we're offenders now appear soul vexed and begin, why to me? Had she such power, she had just cause. She had, and would incense me to murder her I married. Yet so, were I the ghost that walked, 
I'll bid you mark her eye and tell me for what dull part in it you chose her. Then I'd shriek that even your ears should riff to hear me, and the words that followed should be, remember mine. Stars. Stars and all eyes else are dead coals. Fear thou no wife. I'll have no wife, Paulina. Will you swear never to marry but by my free leave? Never, Paulina, so be blessed, my spirit. When good my lords bear witness to his oath. <laughs> you tempt him over much. Unless another, as like Hermione is, is her picture, affront his eye. Uh, good madam. I've done. Yet, if my lord will marry, if you will, sir, no remedy, but you will, Give me the office to choose you a queen. She shall not be so young as was your former, but she shall be such as walked your first queen's ghost. It should take joy to see her in your arms. My true Paulina, we shall not marry till thou bidst us. That shall be when your first queen's again in breath. Never till then. A gentleman enters. One that gives out himself Prince Florizel, son of Polixenes, with his princess. She, the fairest I have yet beheld, desires access to your high presence. What with him? He comes not like to his father's greatness. His approach, so out of circumstance and sudden, tells us tis not a visitation framed, but forced, by need and accident. What train? But few, and those but mean. His princess say you with him? Aye, the most peerless piece of earth, I think, that e'er the sun shone bright upon. Oh, Hermione, as every present time doth boast itself above a better gone, so must thy grave give way to what's seen now. Sir, you yourself have said and writ so, but your writing now is colder than that theme. She had not been, nor was not to be equalled. Thus your verse flowed with her beauty once. Tis shrewdly ebbed to say you have seen a better. Pardon, madame, the one I have almost forgot. Your pardon. The other, when she has obtained your eye, will have your tongue, too. This is a creature, would she begin a sect, might quench the zeal of all professors else, make proselytes of who she bid but follow. How? Not women? A woman will love her, that she is a woman more worth than any man. Men, that she is the rarest of all women. Go, Cleomenes. Yourself, assisted with your honour's friends, bring them to our embracement. Still, tis strange he thus should steal upon us. Cleomenes and others exit. Had our prince, jewel of children, seen this hour, he had paired well with this lord. There was not a full month between their births. Privy, no more. Cease. Thou know'st he dies to me again when talked of. Sure, when I see this gentleman, thy speeches will bring me to consider that which may unfurnish me of reason. They are come. Re-enter Cleomenes and others, with Florizel and Perdita. Your mother was most true to wedlock, Prince, for she did print your royal father off. Conceiving you were I but twenty-one, your father's image is so hitting you, his very air that I should call you brother, as I did him, and speak of something wildly by us performed before. Most dearly welcome. And your fair princess, goddess. Oh, alas, I lost a couple. 
That twixt heaven and earth might thus have stood begetting wonder as you, gracious couple, do. And then I lost all mine own, fo own folly, the society, amity too, of your brave father, whom, though bearing misery, I desire my life once more to look on him. By his command have I here touched Sicilia, and from him give you all the greetings that a king at friend can send his brother. And but infirmity which waits upon worn times hath something seized his wished ability. He had himself the lands and waters twixt your throne and his measured to look upon you whom he loves. He bade me say so, more than all the scepters and those that bear them living. Oh, my brother, good gentleman, the wrongs I've done thee stir afresh within thee, and these thy offices so rarely kind are as interpreters of my behindhand slackness. Welcome hither, as is the spring to the earth, and hath he too exposed this paragon to the fearful uses, at least ungentle, of dreadful Neptune, to greet a man not worth her pains, much less the adventure of her person? Good, my lord, she came from Libya. Where the warlike Samlus, that noble, honoured lord, is feared and loved? Most royal sir, from thence, from him whose daughter his tears proclaimed his, parting with her, thence a prosperous south wind friendly, we have crossed to execute the charge my father gave me for visiting your highness. My best train I have from your Sicilian shores dismissed, who for Bohemia bend, to signify not only my success in Libya, sir, but my arrival and my wife's in safety here where we are. The blessed gods purge all infection from our air whilst you do climb it here. You have a holy father, a graceful gentleman, against whose person, so sacred as it is, I have done sin. For which the heavens, taking angry note, has left me issueless, and your father blessed, as he from heaven merits it, with you, worthy his goodness. What might I have been? Might I, a son and daughter now, have looked on such goodly things as you? A lord enters. Most noble sir. That which I shall report will bear no credit, for not the proof so nigh. Please you, great sir, Bohemia greets you from himself by me, desires you to attach his son who has his dignity and duty both cast off, fled from his father, from his hopes, and with a shepherd's daughter. Where's Bohemia? Speak! Here in your city. I now came from him. I speak amazedly, and it becomes my marvel and my message. To your court, whilst he was hastening in the chase, it seems, of, of this fair couple, meets he on the way the father of this seeming lady and her brother, having both their country quitted with this young prince. Camillo has betrayed me, whose honour and whose honesty till now endured all weathers. Led so to his charge, he's with the king your father. Who? Camillo? Camillo, sir. I spake with him, who now has these poor men in question. Never saw I wretches so quake. They kneel, they kiss the earth, or swear themselves as often as they speak. But he mere stops his ears and threatens them with died, divers deaths and death. My poor father, the heaven set spies upon us, and not have our contract celebrated. You are married? We are not, sir. Nor are we like to be. The stars I see will kiss the valleys first. The odds for high and lows alike. My lord, is this the daughter of a king? She is, when once she is my wife. That once I see by your good father's speed will come on very slowly. I'm sorry, most sorry that you were broken from his liking where you were tied in duty, and as sorry your choice is not so rich in worth as beauty that you might well enjoy her. Dear, look up. Though fortune, visible an enemy, should chase us with my father, power no jot hath she to change our loves. I beseech you, sir, remember, since you owe no more to time than I do now, 
with thought of such affections, step forth, mine advocate, at your request, my father will grant precious things as trifles. Would he do so, I'll beg your precious mistress, which he counts but a trifle. Sir, my liege, your eye hath too much youth in't. Not a month for your queen died. She was more worth such gazes than what you look on now. I thought of her, even in these looks I made. But your petition is yet unanswered. I will to your father, your honour not o'erthrown by your desires. I am friend to them, and you, upon which errand I now go towards him. Therefore, follow me, and mark what I make. Come, my good lord. And they all exit. Act 5, scene 2, before Laontes' palace. Enter Autolycus and a gentleman. Uh, beseech you, sir, were you present at this relation? I was by at the opening of the far door, heard the old shepherd deliver the manner how he found it, whereupon, after a little amazedness, we were all commanded out of the chamber. Only this, methought I heard the shepherd say, he found the child. I would most gladly know the issue of it. Oh, I make a broken delivery of the business, but the changes I perceived in the king and Camilla were very notes of admiration. They seemed almost, with staring on one another, to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in their dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as they had heard of a world ransomed of one destroyed. A notable passion of wonder appeared in them. But the wisest beholder, that knew more but seeing, could not say if the importance were joy or sorrow, but in the extremity of the one it must needs be. Enter another gentleman. Ah, oh, here comes a gentleman that happily knows more. Uh, the news, Rogero? And nothing but bonfires, the oracle is fulfilled, the king's daughter is found, such a deal of wonder is broken out within this hour that ballad makers cannot be able to express it. Enter a third gentleman. Ah, here comes the Lady Paulina Stewart. He can deliver you more. Uh, how goes it now, sir? This news which is called true is so like an old tale that the verity of it is in strong suspicion. Uh, has the king found his heir? Most true, if ever truth were pregnant by circumstance. And that which you hear, you'll swear you see, there is such a unity in the proofs. The mantle of Queen Hermione, the jewel about the neck of it, the letters of Antigonus found with it which they know to be his character, the majesty of the creature in resemblance of the mother, the affection of nobleness which nature shows above her breeding, and many other evidences proclaim her with all certainty to be the king's daughter. Did you see the meeting between the two kings? Uh, no. Then you have lost a sight which was to be seen, cannot be spoken of. There might you have beheld one joy crown another, and so in such manner that it seemed sorrow wept to take leave of them, for their joy waited in tears. There was casting up of eyes, holding up of hands, with countenances of such distraction that they were to be known by the garment, not by the favour. Our king, being ready to leap out of himself for joy of his found daughter, as if that joy were now become a lost cries oh thy mother thy mother then asks bohemia forgiveness then embraces his son-in-law then again worries he is his daughter uh, with clipping her now he thanks the old shepherd which stands by like a weather bitten conduit of many kings reigns i have never heard of such another encounter which lanes report to follow it and undoes description to do it oh, what pray you became of antigonus uh, that carried hints of the child like an old tale still, which will have matter to rehearse, though credit be asleep and not an ear open. He was torn to pieces with a bear. This avouches the shepherd's son, who has not only his innocence, which seems much, to justify him, but a handkerchief and rings of his that Paulina knows. What became of his bark and his followers? Wrecked the same instant of their master's death, and in the view of the shepherd so that all the instruments which aided to expose the child were even then lost when it was found. Oh, but oh, the noble combat that twixt joy and sorrow was fought in Paulina. She had one eye declined for the loss of her husband, another elevated that the oracle was fulfilled. 
she lifted the princess from the earth and so locks her in embracing as if she would pin her to her heart that she might no more be in danger of losing. Oh, the dignity of this act was worth the audience of kings and princess, for by such was it acted. One of the prettiest touches of all, and that which angled for mine eyes, caught the water through not the fish, was when, at the relation of the queen's death, and the manner how she came to it bravely, confessed and lamented by the king, how attentiveness wounded his daughter, till, from one sign of dollar to another, she did, and with an Alas, I would fain say, bleed tears, for I am sure my heart wept blood. Who was most marble there, charged, changed color, some swooned, all sorrowed. If all the world could have seen it, the woe would have been universal. Are they returned to the court? No, the princess hearing of her mother's statue, which is in the keeping of Paulina, a piece many years in doing and now performed by the rare Italian master, Giulio Romano, who, had he himself in eternity, could put breath into his work, would beguile nature of her custom. So perfectly he is her ape. He, so near to Hermione, hath done Hermione that they say one would speak to her and stand in hope of answer. Thither, with all greediness of affection, they are gone, and there they intend to sup. Uh, I thought she had some great matter there in hand, uh, for she hath privately twice or thrice a day, ever since the death of Hermione, visited that removed house. Shall we thither, and with our company peace the rejoicing? Who will be then that has the benefit of access? Every wink of an eye some new grace will be born. Our absence makes us unthrifty to our knowledge. Let's along. And the lads exit. Now, had I not the dash of my former life in me, would preferment drop on my head. I brought the old man and his son abroad the prince, told him I heard them talk of a fardel, and I know not what, but he at that time over fond of the shepherd's daughter, so he then took her to be, who began to be much seasick, and himself little better, extremity of weather continuing, this mystery remained undiscovered. But tis all one to me, for I, for had I been the finder out of this secret, it would not have relished among my other discredits. The shepherd and the clown enter. Here comes those I have done good to against my will, and already appearing in the blossoms of their fortune. Come, boy, I am past my children, but their sons and daughters will be all gentlemen born. You are well met, sir. You did not to fight with me this other day, because I was no gentleman born. See you these clothes? Say you see them not, and think me still no gentleman born. You were best to say these robes are not gentlemen born. Give me the lie, do, and try whether I am now a gentleman born. I know you are now, sir, a gentleman born. Aye, and have been so any time these four hours. And so have I, boy. So you have. But I was a gentleman born before my father, for the king's son took me by the hand and called me brother. And then the two kings called my father brother, and then the prince my brother and the princess my sister called my father father. And so we wept, and there was the first gentleman-like tears that ever we shed. We may leave son to shed many more. Aye, or else twere hard luck, being in so pro preposterous a state as we are. I humbly beseech you, sir, to pardon me all the faults I have committed to your worship, and to give me your good report to the prince, my master. Pray thee, son, do, for we must be gentle now we are gentlemen. Thou wilt amend thy lie? Aye, and it like your good worship. Give me thy hand. I will swear to the prince thou art as honest a true fellow as any is in Bohemia. You may say it, but not swear it. Sw uh, not swear it? Now am I a gentleman? Let Boris and Franklin say it. I'll swear it. How, oh, if it be false, son? 
if it be ne'er so false, a true gentleman may swear it in the behalf of his friend, and I'll swear to the prince, thou art a tall fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt not be drunk, uh, but I know thou art no tall fellow of thy hands, and that thou wilt be drunk, but I'll swear it, and I would thou wouldst be a tall fellow of thy hands. I will prove so, sir, to my power. Ah, and by any means prove a tall fellow. If I do not wonder how thou darest venture to be drunk, not being a tall fellow, trust me not. Hark, the kings and the princes, our kindred, are going to see the queen's picture. Come, follow us, we'll be thy good master. And they all exit. Act 5, scene 3. A chapel in Paulina's house. Enter... Pretty much everyone. Leontes, Polyxenes, Florizel, Perdita, Camillo, Paulina, Lords, and attendants. Oh, grave and good Paulina, the great comfort that I have had of thee. What Sovereign Sir I did not well, I meant well. All my services you have paid home, but that you have vouchsafed. With your crowned brother, and there your contracted heirs of your kingdom, my poor house to visit. It is a surplus of your grace, which never my life may last to answer. Oh, Paulina, we honour you with trouble. But we came to see the statue of our queen. Your gallery have we passed through, not without much content in many singularities. But we saw not that which my daughter came to look upon, the statue of her mother. As she lived peerless, so her. Dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon or hand of man hath done. Therefore, I keep it lonely, apart. But here it is. Prepare to see the life as lively mocked as ever, still sleep mocked death. Behold, and say tis well. Paulina draws a curtain and discovers Hermione standing like a statue. I like your silence. It the more shows off your wonder. But yet, speak. First you, my liege, comes it not something near? Her natural posture. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed, thou art Hermione. Or rather, thou art she in thy not chiding, for she was as tender as infancy and grace but yet paulina hermione was not so much wrinkled nothing so aged as this seems oh not by much so much the more our carver's excellence which uh, uh let's go by some 16 years and makes her as she lived now as now she might have done so much to my good comfort as it is now piercing to my soul. Oh, thus she stood, even with life of, ma- ma- life of majesty. Warm life, as now it coldly stands when I first wooed her. I am ashamed. Does not the stone rebuke me for being more stone than it? Oh, royal peace, there's magic in thy majesty, which has my evils conjured to remembrance from thy admiring daughter took the spirits, standing like stone with thee. And give me leave, and do not say to superstition that I kneel and then implore her blessing. Lady, dear queen, that ended when I but began, give me that hand of yours to kiss. Oh, patience. The statue is, uh, but newly fixed. The colour's not dry. My lord, your sorrow was too sore laid on, which sixteen winters cannot blow away. So many summers dry, scarce any joy did ever so long live. No sorrow but killed itself much sooner. Dear my brother, let him that was the cause of this have power to take off so much grief from you as he had will peace upon himself. Indeed, my lord, if I had thought the sight of my poor image would thus have wrought you, for the stone is mine, I'd not have showed it. Do not throw up the curtain. No longer shall you gaze on't, 
lest your fancy may think an on it moves. Let be. Let be. Would I were dead, but that methinks already. What was he that did make it? See, my lord, would you not deem it breathed? And those veins did verily bear blood. Masterly done. The very life seems warm upon her lip. The fixture of her eye has motion in us, as we are mocked with art. I'll draw the curtain. My lord's almost so far transported that he'll think it on it lives. Oh, sweet Paulina, make me to think so twenty years together. No settled senses of the world can match the pleasure of that madness. Let alone. I am sorry, sir, I have thus far stirred you. But I could afflict you, father. Do, Paulina, for this affection has a taste as sweet as any cordial comfort. Still, methinks there is an air that comes from her. What fine chisel, chisel could ever yet cut breath? Let no man mock me, for I will kiss her. Good my lord, forbear! The readiness upon her lip is wet. You'll mar it if you kiss it. Stain your own with oily painting. Shall I draw the curtain? No, not these twenty years. So long could I stand by, a looker on. Either forbear. Quit presently the chapel, or resolve you for more amazement. If you can behold it, I'll make the statue move indeed, descend and take you by the hand. Ah, but then you'll think, which I protest against, I am assisted by wicked powers. What you can make her do, I am content to look on. What to speak I am content to hear, for tis as easy to make her speak as move. It is required you do awake your faith. Then all stand still. On those that think it is unlawful business I am about, let them depart. Proceed. No foot shall stir. Music? Awake her. Strike. And music begins to play. Tis time. Descend. Be stoned no more. Approach. Strike all that look upon with marvel. Come, I'll fill your grave up. Stir. Nay, come away. Bequeath to death your numbness. For from him, dear life, redeems you. You perceive, she stirs. Hermione comes down. Start not. Her actions shall be holy, as you hear my spell is lawful. Do not shun her until you see her die again. For then you kill her double. Nay, present your hand. When she was young, you wooed her. Now in age, is she become the suitor? Oh, she's warm! If this be magic, let it be an art as lawful as eating. <laughs> she embraces him. She hangs about his neck. If she pertain to life, let her speak too. Aye, and make it manifest where she has lived. Oh, how stolen from the dead! That she is living, were it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale. But it appears she lives, though yet she speak not. Mark a little while. Please you to interpose, fair madam. Kneel and pray your mother's blessing. Turn, good lady, our Perdita is found.
You gods, look down and from your sacred vial pour your graces upon my daughter's head. Tell me mine own. Where hast thou been preserved? Where lived? How found thy father's court? For thou shalt hear, and I, knowing by Paulina, that the oracle gave thou wast be in being, have preserved myself to see the issue. There's time enough for that, lest they desire upon this push to trouble your joys with like relation. Go together, you precious winners all, your exaltation partake to every one. I, an old turtle, will wing me to some withered bough, and there my mate that's never to be found again, lament till I am lost. Oh, peace, Paulina, thou shouldst take our husband, take by my consent, as I thine wife. This is a match, a maid between by bowels. Thou hast found mine. But how is to be questioned? For I saw her as though dead, and have in vain said many a prayer upon her grave. I'll seek not far. For him I partly know his mind to find thee an honourable husband. Come, Camillo, take her by the hand, whose worth and honesty is richly noticed and here justified by us. A pair of kings. Let us from this place. What look upon my brother, both your pardons that ere I put between your holy looks my ill suspicion. This is your son in law, and son unto the king who heavens directing is troth plight to your daughter. Good Paulina, lead us from hence, where we may leisurely each one demand an answer to his part performed in this wide gap of time since first we were dissevered. Hastily, lead away. And they all exit. And that is the end of Act 5, and indeed, the end of The Winter's Tale. Hey. Hey! Oh, wow. oh, that was a ride. It was so good. <laughs> that was delightful. <laughs> oh boy. Oh. Anyway, we will, as is traditional, uh, go down the cast list as the order in the order it is uh, presented on the screen and the Discord call. So we start first with Weak Boson. Oh, hello. Yes, I go by Weak Boson on Twitch. Uh, I play ooh, Autolycus, Piloxenes, Florizel, um, and some bonus characters. Um, yeah, I had so much fun doing this. I wasn't familiar with the play, but it's just been... It's really fun. I love it. It turns out it's good. Shakespeare is good, actually. Um, <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm really happy we got to do this. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining in. Woo! Woo! Oh. Yeah! Next up, we have Dasher. Hello. Um, I don't know what to say at the things. Uh, it was fun, I guess. A little chaotic. Uh, another shout out to Russia from Shakespeare for some reason. Uh, <laughs> um, I do nothing, so I have nothing to plug. Ah. Uh, Shucks. People think I did great. What? Sorry, what? <laughs> um, uh, take your meds and don't forget to hydrate. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dasha. Woo! Hell yeah. Uh, okay, next up we have Akane. Hi. Um, God, my voice is slightly sore now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I played, let's see. Uh, oh, God. How many characters did I play? Uh, so, Paulina, the first gentleman, the officer, the uncounted gentleman, um, a jailer, Dorcas, and the second lady. There we go. Um, this was delightful. Uh, and playing against all of you is delightful as always. I cannot believe we managed this 
33 role play on a cast of six actors <laughs> and yet somehow <laughs> i see the uh akane versus akane scene being called out in chat um <laughs> there there were actually two akane versus akane scenes <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is a very good reason to go back and this will be my plug for today uh, watch the VOD of this stream or one of our older plays on YouTube because they're all up on there uh, this one yeah. will be up there too very very soon so uh, go there and check out a play you maybe missed or that you want to experience again we have like a, a surprising number of those up now so Go do that, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing, especially. Oh yeah. This has been delightful. Woo! I, I was a cheering Akane there, not myself, for organizing. You deserve it. You deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is Ellie. Hi. So, um... This, so I played um, Perdita, the Lord, Cleomenes, and Amelia, um, which was fun. <laughs> it was um, good to hop back into Thunderdome. I think I've only done one Thunderdome so far in my time with Crokespear. Um, please excuse the metallic sounds that are coming from um, my end of the stream, if you can hear them. <laughs> Some guy on my street in my block is, um, for some reason, trying to shovel plants out of the road, and it's, it's a bit <laughs> weird. <laughs> oh, a bit weird. Like I, I muted myself briefly to go and check what the sound was. <laughs> yeah, the perfect as, Shakespearean as backdrop. Indeed, indeed. Um. But this was really fun, and I'm glad I could take part in it. I'm sorry if I sounded slightly sleepy, just today has been a busy day, and I've been very tired. So <laughs> it's great. Thank you. Did. you. Absolutely wonderful. Indeed. As a final reminder, trans rights, Black Lives Matter, and hydrate, not dihydrate. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. And next we have RJ. Hi. Uh, who did I play? I played Antigonus. <laughs> Ar Ar Archidamus, Ar how are we pronouncing his name? The guy in the first scene who never showed up again. Uh, Hermione. Third Gentleman. Time. The Clown. I think that's everyone. Uh, you played the Mariner, too. <laughs> and the Mariner, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had I had a lot of roles. It was a lot of fun. That was my cat. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> no, great, great performance from the cat. Good there. cat. Bravo, Absolutely Bravo. cat. <laughs> yeah. Round of applause for RJ. Hell yeah. And the cat, yeah. but mainly RJ. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! We do a separate round of cat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and next on the list, uh, we have me. Hello, I'm Sarah. Um, I played, uh, Leontes. I was the narrator. I also played a servant of a shepherd, um, the first lady, and some un lords in unison, which was very fun. Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me on this. I uh, yeah, I uh, had a lot of fun organising it, and I'm glad that people people went along with me on this this zany <laughs> scheme. Um, and yeah, no, thank you very much, and I hope people enjoyed it. And yeah, tune in for more Croakspear content in the future. Hell yeah! Yeah. Woo! You did so good, Sarah. Possibly Absolutely. your greatest role um, to date, Unison Lords. We'll be talking about it for ages. <laughs> oh, thank you. Lords. Oh, Absolutely. The Unison Lords. I did I did study for this moment my whole life. Um, 
And yeah. last only but, that role was in the cult read. <laughs> only that role, yeah. Only that one. Uh, and last, but by no means least, it would be remiss of me not to shout out our wonderful host, Ray Mystical Design. Who Hell yeah! Has put Thank up you so with, much, Ray. <laughs> who has put up with our rubbish for nearly a year now. And is just <laughs> always oh there and, and amazing. So I think a massive round of applause to Ray. We appreciate Absolutely. you the most. Perpetual <laughs> birth, Ray. Yeah. Happy, Happy birthday, perpetual Ray. birth, Ray. Right. Well, um, I think I think that's all from us. Um, we will be raiding someone, I believe, uh, after this. Yeah, and I think we're reading Sean from well, at Sean from YouTube on Twitch. Yes, excellent. Cool. So everybody, stay in the chat. But thank you very much for listening, and stay tuned to Croakspear. We oh, will have follow the Twitter, follow the Twitch, yeah. follow Twitter, the Twitter. follow the Jellicle bots. Yes, and Jellicle bots. Jellicle bots. Jellicle bots. <laughs> we can never forget the Jellicle bots. Absolutely not. <laughs>